So welcome everybody uh, to the first day of the 2021 spring FPA meeting. Uh, this will be a full program again for three days and uh, we look forward to stimulating discussions. But before we go to the next slide, uh, you may wonder about those uh, graphics there, those photos on, on the front. And I can start on the left. You're looking at the flat irons in, in Boulder and we're expecting some rain, which is great. So it's not snow for a chain. So, uh, so the, 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 the right, the two pictures on the right are, um, uh, <laughs> Uh, the, the leftmost, uh, the one with the oak tree growing out of my former um, pickup truck, uh, is what happened in my driveway about three weeks ago when a giant oak tree came crashing down from our backyard uh, onto the truck. And um, I, I'm happy to report, A, there's nobody in the truck when it happened. Um, B, it was uh, it was my work truck, so uh, you know it's it's not a a significant loss. And trying to put a positive spin on this, it did um, take out another tree, which opened up a natural canopy for me to install a home weather station. So last weekend, uh, an ambient WS twenty nine zero two C went up in the corner that was cleared out by that giant oak tree, and is now reporting faithfully reporting the weather here in Ackworth, Georgia to me and anybody else who cares to listen. So there you go, Matthias. Okay, so let's move on to the next slide and just a few uh, bookkeepings here, housekeepings. Uh, we are holding this meeting virtual again, as you may have noticed, given that the ongoing pandemic situation is not yet uh, mastered enough that we can meet in person again. So we have obviously mastered how to do virtual meetings and that is great. And uh, so we have scheduled it in a way that people from across the US from coast to coast may be able to join us here. That's why we're starting at 11 East Coast time and last till what is it, about 3.30 or so East Coast time uh, in the afternoon. And uh, the meeting will be recorded, so be mindful what you're saying. Uh, we may be able to point back at you. Uh, let's see what else. Please mute your microphones uh, while you're not speaking. That really helps minimize background noise and uh, make us hear the speaker better. And if you have questions or comments, please use the chat room capability there to submit those comments. We have Dave Strand, as in the past, monitoring that and at the appropriate time be able to, you know, bring up your questions and comments. And depending on how complicated it is, he may invite you to actually explain that a little more, in which case you may unmute yourself. But otherwise, please stay muted. Uh, let's see, looking at the agenda, we have three days, as said before. Today, we are looking at the main theme is the digital transformation of flight services, essentially the human assisted briefing, uh, briefing to pilot self briefings, that transition, what has evolved, that will be the theme of today. And then the uh, smaller session after that, we'll talk about spectrum interference and weather observations. You see there also the topics for tomorrow, uh, Wednesday and Thursday. Uh, so I don't want to dwell on that and hand it back to Matt in case you have something else or get us kicked off with uh, Janet's session here. Thank you, Matthias. Uh, the only thing I would point out uh, also on that slide, and you may have already said it and I just missed it, is that our planning meeting will be on Wednesday, May the 12th. So it'll be two weeks from tomorrow. Um, and um, as always, uh, you know, we'll be looking for topics for upcoming uh, FPA meetings. Uh, and um, there are a couple of ways that you can submit um, uh, those topics. Uh, one is to come to the meeting and and you know verbally uh, describe what it is you'd like to see FPA talking about. Another is to um, uh, to go to the FPA website, which is at uh, fpaw.aero, 
and um, and and there is a uh, topic submission button um, uh, available, I believe, right on the on the front page of the website, and and you can uh, submit a topic that way. We we frankly would welcome um, folks using that capacity, especially since right now the only ones who seem to be using it with regularity are the Russian trolls that send us messages in the Cyrillic alphabet that we can't understand anyhow. Uh, and, and, um, and, and or you can send an email to Matthias or myself or any of the other uh, uh, FPA uh, longtime folks, Rhonda Moore, uh, who's uh, behind the scenes uh, knitting all of this together in a meaningful way. And, and, uh, uh, we'll we'll certainly get that out in front of um, of the planning meeting. Um, the, the only other uh, thing I want to mention, uh, which I've I've uh, put a couple of um, posts already in the chat, is that we have a survey uh, that is live that we would uh, appreciate your participating in and taking in the beginning part of this meeting. It will be available for approximately the next um, 15 or 20 minutes. And, um, and then uh, it will be, this particular survey will be stopped. Um, and uh, the survey, this poll was put together by, uh, by the folks uh, who organized our first session uh, today, uh, Janet Ford and Hazeman. Um, and and um, you, you know your responses to this survey will will certainly help um, help them get a uh, a good read on on some information that 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 they're 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 very interested in 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 seeing you know what what your uh, your, your responses are uh, it, it is it was set up as a true false. Uh, type of survey, but the survey mechanism that we're using, which is a, an app called Meeting Pulse, uh, has only yes/no responses. So consider yes to be true and no to be false, and then uh, proceed forward with the uh, the, um, uh, the the surveys from there, if you would please. Um, so without any further ado, uh, I think that's all I have to say. Let me turn the meeting over to Mr. Jeff Black from the FAA, who is going to kick off this first session with some opening remarks and introductions. Jeff? Uh, thank you, Matt, uh, Matthias, and uh, everybody for attending. I, I, I do appreciate the opportunity that you guys have provided us today. Uh, to highlight some of the things that have been going on with the flight service. Uh, for myself, again, my name is Jeff Black. I'm the team lead for the flight service engagement team. I, I've been with flight service now for just over 40 years. Uh, it's gone by pretty quick, actually. Um, and But I have to tell you something that uh, for the first 20 years of my career, uh, not a whole lot really changed. Uh, but then something happened uh, uh, along my career and along came the Internet. Uh, nothing like technology in the private sector to come along and, and force the, the agency to, to make some uh, changes out there. Uh, we have a, a number of speakers uh, here today uh, that's going to talk about the changes that have occurred over the last uh, uh, many years. Uh, most of them have a number of years of experience uh, with flight service. Uh, a number of them are pilots themselves. Uh, and a number of them have worked with flight standards, uh, and they're all here today to uh, tell our story. Our first speaker today uh, is Janet Ford. Uh, she's a consultant with the Capital Group, and she's been supporting flight service for the last several years, and she brings a wealth of knowledge and experience to the table. Uh, she holds an MBA and is the CEO and founder of Leadership with Purpose and Passion located in Northern Virginia. She's going to provide us with a kind of an overview uh, of the history of uh, flight service over the years. Uh, following uh, Janet uh, will be Frankie, uh, Frances Pratt. Uh, she holds a bachelor's degree in applied meteorology. And because of that, uh, we've selected her as our resident subject matter expert on weather uh, for flight services uh, safety and operations policy group. Uh, she's been a flight service specialist and operations manager for LIDOS at the Washington DC hub 
prior to joining us here at headquarters. She'll discuss some of the stakeholder engagement activities we've been involved with for the last couple of years. Marilyn Pearson, uh, many of you probably know, uh, she's going to follow Frankie. Uh, she's an ATP rated pilot in just about every uh, imaginable uh, aircraft that's out there. Uh, she brings over 40 years of experience as an aviation professional. She served as a corporate pilot in several jet aircraft types before taking a position as an aviation safety inspector with the FAA. She's going to discuss FAA regulations, CFR 91-103, and the recently issued advisory circular uh, 91-92. Uh, Joe Daniele, uh, he's been with Lockheed Martin, now Lidos, uh, for the last 15 years. He's the senior systems engineer with uh, Lidos. He's a graduate of DeVry University. He's an active pilot, and he'll discuss some of the upcoming changes uh, in the delivery of flight service uh, from the Lidos perspective. Jim Hazeman, he's uh, also a consultant with the Capital Group. He's been supporting us for the last five years. Uh, he brings a wealth of knowledge and ex expertise in systems integration, service center operations, and automation. He's a graduate of Rutgers and John Hopkins University. He's an active private pilot and a volunteer with the Angel Flight Mid-Atlantic chapter. Uh, he'll speak to our education initiative in pre-flight self-briefing. Our next speaker is uh, going to be Gary Kopodner, uh, a graduate from Lehigh University. He came to the FAA in 2011. Uh, after spending 25 years working for Air Inc. on military avionics acquisition programs. Since coming to the FAA, Gary's been the FAA's next-gen weather technology in the cockpit program manager, otherwise known as WIDIC. He's managing a portfolio of research projects with the overall objective of identifying and resolving gaps in meteorological information in Part 91, 135, and 121 cockpits and pilot weather training with the objective of enhancing operational efficiency and safety. He's going to highlight some of the ongoing research uh, for enhancing weather in the cockpit. I do uh, want to thank all of you again uh, for your participation in uh, today's conference. And now I'll turn it over to our first speaker, uh, Janet Ford. Janet, you want to unmute yourself and go for it. Thank you. Thank you very much. I will need to reshare my screen. Um, just a second here. So, so while you. Janet is resharing, let, let me let me point out that Frankie Pratt went to a fine, fine institution of higher learning early in her career, which I'd like to, to send a shout out to. Yes, thank you so <laughs> very much. Um, did you want to did you want to say something, Matt? No, that was enough. Was that enough? <laughs> OK, all right. So let me finish here. All right. Thank you so much. Thank you, Jeff, so much for that. Um, again, I want to welcome everyone to the digital transformation of flight service. Um, the human assisted briefings to self assisted briefings. Um, I do want to please, if you have not done so, um, go ahead and click in the chat and click on the link and answer the questions for our poll. We would greatly, greatly appreciate that. Thank you so very much. So the overview of flight service. So did many of you know that the first federal air traffic facilities in the United States actually date back to August 20th of 1920? That's a long time ago. On that date, the post office actually the Post Office Department actually issued the orders to establish the first air mail radio stations along the transcontinental air mail route. It was 2,612 mile route from New York to San Francisco, and it had about 17 primary landing fields, um, and each would have its own air mail radio station. And these stations actually were the forerunners of today's flight service stations. In 1979 is when I began my FAA career. I, I selected flight service as my career option of choice. My training instructors at the time were actually center controllers and thought that I was making a really big mistake considering at the time I was actually only 22 years old. And only those over 35 years old or those that were unsuccessful and some of the other options were actually in flight service at the time. 
However, I really did not change my mind for whatever reason. And actually, a few years later, I was really glad that I didn't because flight service actually became the saving grace uh, for the entire air traffic system. I was so proud to actually be able to serve when actually needed most during those times. At that time, there were over 300 flight service stations in the entire United States, but actually plans for closing and reducing the number of facilities down to 61 were well underway, well before I was even hired. I actually had the pleasure of being in the midst of that change. Actually, the night I worked at Macon Flight Service, I transitioned over to the Macon Automated Flight Service. I actually worked the midnight shift that night and I helped move most of the facility items into the new Macon Automated Flight Service Station right across the street. We actually the old building, we plugged up the facsimile machine, many of you probably remember what that was, and to get the charts that were actually still coming out of the machine. And we took down the clothesline that we actually hung them up to dry, and we brought the charts, we brought the clothesline and the clothespins over to the new building. So we hung up the line, we put the charts up to dry, and actually the phones were actually ringing at that time. So pilots who were walking in to see the new building the next morning, the first thing they saw was the clothesline. And they said, what are y'all doing? Are y'all hanging up clothes? So it was really a, a big joke for a long time because they could not believe that we were in this new building, but yet we still had a clothesline hanging up. So that was kind of a joke. So when you think about flight service, when we talk about the hundred years of flight service, we're really referring to a hundred year old relationship, a relationship with the aviation community, specifically the local pilots who relied on human assisted services that they were accustomed to receiving every time they called or walked into a facility. The local pilot depended on flight service for all of their meteorological and aeronautical information. Because outside of the Weather Channel or local news, resources for attaining aviation weather was scarce. Flight service was the primary source for aeronautical information prior to any online resources and considered actually the subject matter experts for interpolating aviation weather products outside of the National Weather Service. Flight service was the major part of the aviation community and regularly participated in FISDO aviation safety meetings, spoke to student pilots at all of the flight schools, worked with the Civil Air Patrol on a regular basis, and with the local law enforcement during aircraft emergency situations. The flight service specialists built relationships within the aviation community. They served by speaking at all of the local high schools to students on careers in aviation, even introducing aviation to elementary school children by taking what we call the Air Bear program, to even into the classrooms, conducting facility tours on a regular basis, actively participating in air shows, and even, yes, for those of you that remember, traveling around and setting up that mobile flight service station to conduct pilot briefings at some of the major air shows even across the country. So when we look at flight service today, as with anything, change happens. So today, flight service has changed the way information is delivered to the pilot. But the one thing that has not changed is our dedication to serve the aviation community. Flight service continues to provide the aeronautical and meteorological information that services the pilot before, during, and after flight, and has always supported the FAA's mission to provide the safest and the most efficient airspace system in the world. And today, through continued research and development of new aviation technology, 
Flight Service is continuing to support the FAA's mission with the evolution of pilot weather briefings conducted by using the automated resources. So we have a short video that's entitled The Wild World of Flight Service, where you will hear from our director of flight service, Kathleen Edict, and several others that will be talking about some of the of the operations policy group in the FAA. So thank you so much for your time. Janet, may I suggest you kill your video for now to see if it'll help the uh, the lack of audio? I'm sorry. What did you say? I was. I, I. I think there may be a bandwidth issue, and and uh, see, you've you've cut out a couple of times, and then I heard no audio from the uh, from the movie. So I was suggesting maybe you could you could shut down your camera, and maybe that'll help the uh, the bandwidth issue. But I don't know. Okay. Okay. Do you do you want to run do you want to run the video again because I, I heard. I heard no uh, no audio. Okay. Were you able to hear the presentation? Yes, ma'am. Okay. So, so Jan, maybe it's me, but right now all I have is a uh, um, is our our participant screen with um, with with nine folks uh, up on it, and I'm not hearing or seeing anything else. Okay, all right. So we will I uh, we will uh, go to the next presenter then. And, and and for the folks on the call, I I got to tell you that I know that Janet has practiced and tried and successfully done this numerous times so um so I, I don't know i don't know why it failed here now but it's not from lack of preparation on janet and her team's part i can assure you of that it's okay thank you so much so we will hear from francis brock thank you All right. Hi, friends. Uh, good morning, everyone. My name is Frankie Prod, and I am part of the Flight Service Safety and Operations Policy Group. And today I welcome the opportunity to appear before this community. And this section will give you a very high level view of the roadmap we followed, the Flight Service Engagement Team followed to the digital transformation of Flight Service. And then the rest of the presentations will provide you with more details. So two decades ago, when personal electronic devices were not a thing and laptops were still a luxury and we still still treasure our desktops, flight service was just as important to pilots as air traffic. Every flight across the country or around the pattern started with one mandatory step, a call or a visit to a flight service station to get a pre-flight briefing. The digital transformation of flight services actually began in the mid 1990s, and that's when pilots viewed duots with the same regard as electronic flyback apps are given today. 
but it was around 2005, around the same time the FAA awarded Lockheed Martin the Automated Flight Service Station contract, that private weather companies began showing up online. Back then, pilots used these resources only as an add-on to the information that was provided to them by flight service over the phone or over the counter. But as technology developed and internet performance improved, these free services became more extensive with graphical displays that really gave the pilot a complete weather picture. And it's no wonder why many pilots shifted from the traditional to this more convenient option, right? I mean, online resources give you a chance to take a look at an actual picture. You can look at storm intensity and movement on radar. The satellite shows you exactly where the clouds are. And on top of that, you get all the text. Who wants to scribble around like a court clerk when you can print out the information or save it onto your personal device? I'm, not me, I'm terrible at taking notes. But pilots are creatures of habits and their instructors had taught them that calling flight service was the only way to get an official briefing. They're also taught that a briefing has to be recorded on a recorded line and therefore a self briefing doesn't count. So pilots continue to call flight service, which brings us right back to the topic of flight service achieving a digital transformation. Um, at the time when the first contract was awarded, Flight service stations relied on outdated 1970s era computer technology and the operation and maintenance of an obsolete system became progressively more difficult and very, very expensive. But this new contract actually provided an opportunity to modernize by introducing new processes and systems. So let's take a look at some of this modernization uh, factors. They are many, many online and mobile tools to support self briefings for both VFR and IFR. self briefing resources have been around for over 15 years and their usage has been increasing year after year. self briefing is not inherently risky for adequately trained pilots. Many pilots have shifted over to entirely self briefing and their safety has not been compromised. And ultimately, pilots that can interpret weather data themselves are better prepared and safer. The reality is that pilots that aren't properly trained aren't really safe whether they call flight service or do a self briefing. So considering these factors, we asked ourselves, how do we evolve the way flight service is used by pilots from a primary resource to a consultative tool? Let's be honest, oftentimes it's nice to not have to listen to another person while you're just jotting things down like a maniac. And sometimes we really just need a second opinion because the picture is not quite as clear or clear as we think it should be. So how do we ensure the briefing pilots are getting from other sources are of the same quality? And finally, how do we make sure these self briefings are safe? We're in 2021, and we all know that having access to a lot of information does not make us more educated, and it doesn't mean that the information is properly understood. So it doesn't matter how pretty the colors are or how fast your app refreshes. What matters is the ability to take the information in and really interpret it properly. So at this point, we began putting these challenges into separate buckets uh, that we could focus on. Our first challenge, as we understood, was a lack of understanding on how to comply with regulations. So remember, instructors have been teaching that calling flight service is the only way to get that official briefing, and that a briefing has to be recorded on a recorded line, and that a self-briefing doesn't count. And the truth is those instructors are teaching what they were taught and what the universal understanding of the regulations were. So this led us to the realization that there's a lot of inconsistencies in FAA publications and guidance. Some handbooks and disclaimers refer to online resources and some specifically tell you to call flight service, which leaves us 
I mean, it leaves everyone uh, confused about what is what. And our question still remains, do I need to call? Do I need a recording of my briefing? Does it count if I self brief and there's no record of it? Uh, does it matter if I use a resource that is in the FAA's flight service website? And how do I comply with this regulation? And this question has really brought us back to training. Really, inadequate training is leaving us with a community that doesn't know what resources are available and how to use the tools that are offered. Research has shown that general aviation pilots, their ability to interpret weather is unreliable at best. And essentially, pilots do not know how to use the tools that are available. And bear in mind, this actually includes the information they're receiving from calling or visiting a flight service station. We're not just talking the automated resources, but they're not really understanding what the flight service guy or gal is telling them. So how do we tackle these challenges? How do we reach our goals to modernize and maintain quality and safety? And where do we start? How do we take action? And our answer was collaboration. So we at Flight Service recognized that we could not do this on our own. And we decided to engage with our stakeholders, including the general aviation community, our flight service suppliers, flight schools, universities, AOPA, and other lines of business within the FAA. That includes flight standards and the safety and technical training team. We established a two-way dialogue that allowed the entire team to provide input on how to bridge the gaps and overcome the challenges that we were facing. And once we understood these challenges, we developed a plan and got to work. First, we began by integrating technology and operational needs. Because remember, the contract provided an opportunity to modernize by introducing new processes and systems. This uh, modernization provided much needed user flexibility. For example, you can call flight service or you can go to 1-800-WXBrief.com and today internet users and pilot weather briefers at a, at a flight service station are able to look at the same information at the same time from different locations. That's just fantastic, I think. But Lidus has made it really easy to get a briefing, uh, file flight plans, activate uh, close the flight plans, get updates on the web, on your phone or on your tablet. And while online or using a mobile application, pilots have different options. They can do an interactive map, they can do a root briefing, a PDF briefing, you name it, you got it. So we follow this with a review of the documentation. As I said it earlier, FAA publications and guidance have some conflicted and unclear information that perpetuates the idea that calling flight service and speaking with a person is the only way to comply with regulations. We address these inconsistencies by reviewing publications, guidance, website disclaimers, anything that it indicated you have to call flight service to get a complete briefing. And here's a list of all the artifacts we have reviewed thus far you'll be able to review the list in its entirety once the slides are posted. The first column depicts publications and websites that have already implemented changes. The second column, it's a list of the publications we have submitted change proposals to and an under review by the owners of the documentation. And the last column includes one publication that is expected to be released later this year. That's the Aviation Weather Handbook, and we're all pretty excited about that. And three publications that were superseded by the publication of, or will be superseded by the release of the Aviation Weather Handbook. Uh, the, theme, the team was really through, but if you or anybody in your organization takes a look at the list and understands that or believes that there's something that should be reviewed, please feel free to contact us. So, beyond this digital transformation, we have come to realize that by improving pilots' knowledge and confidence, it's really how we make aviation safer. So, we recognize that a pilot's knowledge in 
their knowledge and whether it needs to be supported by, uh, by proper tools. Otherwise, their ability to effectively use available, available self-assisted services will only go so far. So we must provide the tools to enhance pilots' pre-flight and in-flight planning strategies, and we must provide the tools to enhance their decision-making skills. And we believe that our education and training initiatives will help improve pilots' knowledge and confidence, providing the quality and the safety we're aiming for. So we set our focus on creating skill enhancement tools that will encourage pilots to self-reliantly consume and analyze weather data before and during a flight. The collaboration and assistance from our stakeholders to develop a plan to address our challenges has supported our progress. And that is how we are achieving this digital transformation. Yes, uh, the progress has been incremental and there is still a lot of work ahead of us. But we are very proud of the steps that we have taken thus far and continue pushing forward. And today you'll get to hear about what we've been up to for the last year. Just a reminder, flight service is not going away. However, the FAA considers that a self-briefing may be compliant with current federal aviation regulations. Pilots are encouraged to utilize online automated resources to conduct self-briefings prior to calling flight service. And pilots who have an understanding of the weather and have developed risk mitigation skills are better prepared to make decisions when this real time weather events occur. And before I go, I would like to take a moment to acknowledge our stakeholders. We truly appreciate the support we have received from you from the beginning and really hope to continue working together. If you have any questions or have any comments, please contact us. And next uh, we have Mail in Pearson from CAE. And like Jeff said, former FAA Flight Standards employee, she's gonna tell us about FAA regulations, CFR 91.103, and how she worked with the engagement team to develop advisory circular 9192, which is a pilot's guide to pre-flight briefing published on March 15th of this year. Thank you very much, Marilyn. Thank you, Frankie. And, and uh, uh, hello to everyone. I see that feedback. feedback. Are you all hearing all feedback, feedback as well? Yes, echo. Yes. How about now? Better? Much better, Marilyn. Better. Okay, so um, you won't get to see my smiling face. I am very pleased and happy to be here. Thank you for inviting me to speak, FPA and all the organizers. Um, while I'm not an FAA employee any longer, I spent 24 years working at the FAA. So I'm going to speak from my former regulatory position as an aviation safety inspector in flight standards. You've heard Frankie talk about change and Janet tell you a little bit of the history. I'm going to tell you a little bit of how this flight service change impacted how we look at a regulatory approach. Next slide, please. So what is different now? What's different about pre-flight weather briefings specifically, not just pre-flight briefings, but weather briefings? And what are the challenges that pilots face? You've already heard that there's automation. So for some of us who are of an age, who remember always using 1-800-WEATHER-BRIEF or 1-800-992-7433 embedded into our memory from our early training, this was the only way that pilots would get weather. We would depend on flight service, that voice on the other end of the phone. We'd identify our end number and what our intent was, and the briefer would tell us everything we needed to know. All the information was already provided and we depended on them to tell us whether we should go and whether we shouldn't go. And to a certain degree, that was serviceable. It worked pretty well. Uh, the only problem there is that pilots on a whole, taking any test from the private pilot all the way up through the ATP, 
can and some do fail every weather question on the written test and still pass the test. So there is a gap in knowledge, even though pilots are considered trained and qualified and certificated. So we were dependent on that flight service phone briefing. We were also dependent on the actual flight service station. I remember my very first cross country duel with my instructor, we flew to the Poughkeepsie Flight Service Station. And the flight service briefers were very kind. They told me all kinds of information and gave me charts. I think I have one to this day still. So our dependence was there. Now we're transforming into a new generation of digital. Everything is on our cell phone. So we have less reliance on calling flight service. Does that mean we shouldn't call flight service? Well, maybe, maybe not. Um, historically, though, we were so dependent that every flight school had a phone. It didn't even have a, a means to dial. You just picked it up and you were connected to flight service. And pilot lounges, for those of us when we were professional pilots, we were in the pilot lounge planning. We picked up the phone. It was a direct line. To flight service. There was that dependency and, and that feeling of being um, covered by flight service. We were assured of information that helped us. It was a confidence builder to call flight service. But now with the modernization of services, we have the internet, websites, there are subscriptions. Uh, flight service has now become more of a consultative resource not the primary source for most people. And I'd like to stress that there is a variety in the visualization when you're using some of these services. You might be using 1-800-weatherbrief.com. You might be using third-party providers. Some of the visualizations are different in the way that weather is depicted. So I want to caution people that while you're using a service that will provide wonderful information, it's important to know how to analyze that information and maybe compare one to another so that you're not confused if you're mixing and matching your service providers. How does the FAA provide information and education for the GA pilots and any other pilot? Well, there are still briefings available online through the National Weather Service, 1-800-weatherbrief.com. Flight Service is still providing weather briefings. As far as our educational efforts, the FAA safety team, uh, FAA, FAA ST or safety.gov. Many, many courses that have to do with weather how to brief, how to self-brief, how to read charts, a very uh, extensive amount of information for GA pilots. Also, the FAST team goes out to do seminars, which are now virtual seminars. So there's a subscription service for seminars in your area. Uh, you can take advantage of those. Next slide, Frankie, please. The big question, what is a legal briefing? Well, we know that if you're calling flight service, and you're using a phone service, it's a recorded briefing. So is that a legal briefing? Because you got it recorded? What if it isn't recorded? What about when you use a third party resource that may or may not have a recording capability? Which one's gonna be best for you to use? How do you know which one is best? And if you self-brief, is it legal? And, and how are you getting, how do you know if you've got the appropriate briefing if you don't call flight service? All these questions are asked of the FAA quite often. Uh, external stakeholders approach the FAA and wanted clarification as we go into this modernization. Uh, Frankie mentioned several of the organizations that approached flight service, AOPA, Embry-Riddle, other organizations, individuals, 
as we move to online briefings and the modernization of flight service, how do pilots, GA pilots, know that they are getting a legal briefing? Well, you can look in one place about what's legal. The FAA's volume 14 of the 8900, it is the compliance and enforcement section. The handbook 8900 is the recipe book for how aviation safety inspectors conduct their work. And it's available to the general public and not just the FAA inspectors. So if you're really concerned about compliance and enforcement, take a peek at that and see what you think. So have I answered the question? Not yet, but I will. Next slide, please. While stakeholders were asking the FAA to please tell them what is a legal briefing and how do pilots obtain a legal briefing, all of those questions came through both flight service and eventually ended up in AFS 800, the division I worked in for many years. And somehow it landed on my desk and I was assigned to do something about this. So, the development of AC 91-92 started in 2018. It was a product of the stakeholders asking for clarification of how to do pre-flight briefings that met the regulatory requirements. It was also flight service uh, reaching out to flight standards and asking for uh, information on GA pilots uh, development of, of self briefings. How do we educate the pilots? Stakeholder groups still demanded, what is a legal briefing? We want to know what a legal briefing is. And I'll say right now, as far as a legal briefing, AGC, the General Counsel and the FAA, has not defined a legal briefing. So, in order to bridge this gap of how to wean people away from calling flight service and using the internet and third party providers, we developed an advisory circular. And it's called advisory because it is not regulatory. The regulatory requirements are written into 14 CFR 91.103. AC 9192 is an attempt to explain to the public how best to be compliant. And I'll use the word compliant instead of legal. So we're going to delve into this advisory circular a little bit more. Next slide. So the purpose is education. This advisory circular, like most, is going to explain or help you understand regulations. It's called Pilot's Guide to a Pre-Flight Briefing. And as Frankie told you, it was published in March, March 15th, uh, but it was started in 2018. So Flight Standards, AFS 800, the GA and Commercial Division, where I worked for many years, began this task. We collaborated I collaborated with the Flight Service Engagement Team, FSET. So the folks that you're going to be listening to today and Janet and Frankie, who you've already heard from, were an integral part of the development of this advisory circular. No one circular is developed by one person. It takes a team. And because I'm a pilot first and a very interested weather observer second, it was difficult for me to sort out the best way to explain self-briefings. I reached out and the FSET team um, pretty much bailed me out. They were the force behind this advisory circular, gave me the information and, and the meetings weekly and the support to develop this and make it what it is, which I think is a pretty good advisory circular from what I hear from emails and uh, traffic on the internet. So we wanted to answer the questions that people were asking. 
the who, what, when, where, why of pre-flight briefings. How do I do it? Where do I go for the information? What information is more important than other information? How do I process all of it? When do I start my pre-flight briefings? So this advisory circular, we hope, is the best practices for self-briefing using all of the available resources, whether they be FAA resources or other resources. It's mainly an advisory circular that is directed toward the Part 91 or the general aviation community, but it's available to anyone. And it is a good resource. If you take a look at the advisory circular, there's text, tells you how to do your briefings, what's important. And one thing to look at, the last page, Appendix B, has a sample pre-flight checklist. And it's meant to be a tear out. For you, the GA pilot or whatever type of pilot you are, to take with you as a checklist that you would use for your briefings, the same way you would use a pre-flight checklist when you're in the aircraft to start your airplane, taxi out, climb out, descend, whatever you're doing, there's always a checklist. So uh, Appendix B is intended to be that checklist for pilots. Next slide. So, does a legal briefing exist? As I said, there is no specific definition, no interpretation. Compliance and enforcement actions aren't influenced by or predicated on a recorded briefing. The fact that your briefing is recorded is just that. It's recorded, and that's all it is. It's evidence that you called flight service. It's not evidence that you got the appropriate information for the flight, for your experience level, or anything else. So what makes compliant? Pilots are in compliance with many means. Again, what type of a pilot are you? What are your limitations? Are you a 100 hour pilot? Are you a 10,000 hour pilot? Are you IFR? Are you VFR? What type of aircraft are you flying? Are you flying a Cessna 172 at 3,000 feet or are you in a pressurized high performance turboprop? All of these are the what ifs about your briefing. Your briefing should be designed for the type of flight, the type of day, the, the distance, the aircraft, the pilot capabilities, and any more variables that one can think of. So the answer to a legal briefing is it depends. And there's no one type of pre-flight briefing that would serve every pilot's needs. And that's why this AC was developed and this educational outreach to help pilots understand what they need for their experience level. It can be used by pilots, instructors, operators. We emphasized uh, operations conducted under Part 91. And one of the reasons for that is the NTSB has, has always determined that Continued VFR flight into IMC conditions is one of the primary factors, a causal factor in fatal accidents. And we want to reduce those fatal accidents. If you are a VFR pilot, you want to be sure that you can maintain your VFR flight and not fly into IFR conditions unexpectedly or perhaps because you did not get a compliant, a complete, a thorough, and an effective pre-flight briefing. The language in the regulation is not vague, but it is intended for the variance in pilots and situations. 91103 in part says, each pilot in command shall, before beginning a flight, become familiar with all available information concerning that flight. That means before your flight, 
the day before you may start. Maybe you'll get a second briefing early in the morning before you fly, and maybe another briefing right before you go to the airport or while you're at the airport. Maybe you'll do all of it online. Maybe you'll do some of it or most of it online. But again, you can call flight service. They are going to be there for you. Perhaps you have a question about something that you did during your self briefing. You want a little clarification. You may call flight service. Certainly flight service will provide whatever you are asking for. Ensure that you know what you need. If you are a VFR pilot flying a 172 and you're intending to be at 3000 feet, there's no reason to get wind at 10,000 feet. So be sure that you know what you're asking for. Ask for the appropriate information when you call flight service. Tell flight service you've had a briefing. You want a clarification. You want additional information or a last minute update. And lastly, this AC has influenced a FAST or an FAA safety team web course. And you'll be hearing more about that as we go through today's uh, speakers. And it is a follow on to the AC. I wish personally that perhaps the course would have been done before the AC because I think it's pretty terrific. And uh, it might have influenced even more information that would be put into this AC. So with that, um, I will turn it over to our next speaker. Thank you all for your attention. And there'll be a period of uh, Q&A later. So, Matt, can you hear me? This is Joe. Yes, I can, Joe. I hear you just fine. Um, Tell me when you can see my slides, please. Will do. Um, uh, it, Janet, um, are, are you, is, is this what you want to do or do you want to do something a little bit different? Uh, the, Co Coach Ford was suggesting we'd, uh, we'd, we'd take a little uh, a little change from the agenda, given that we're, uh, I think, fairly early at this point. Janet? I think okay. what we can do is that, let me, I, I have the video queued, that we go ahead and show the video, and um, um, since we, and we, then we could just go ahead and take our 10 minute break as we have scheduled, um, and then come back with the second session, um, which would start with, um, with Joe, um, and then go on from there. So we would just still continue as we are going, and um, but we would just start a little early if that's okay. That's that's certainly fine by by me and us, Janet. Uh, we do have at least one question or comment in the chat. When do okay. you want to uh, have more of a two-way dialogue with your audience? Okay. okay. All right. That's fine. And we can go ahead and. Uh, take the question now since it's pertinent to obviously to the first session. And actually, uh, this is Dave Strand. It actually, it is uh, not a question as much as a comment, but it may, uh, you know, bring up a, uh, a question. Uh, it's from Amber Cole, and it was uh, during Marilyn's uh, presentation, uh, which nicely done, Marilyn. Uh, Amber says it would be interesting to see performance changes in usability with different pre-flight briefing applications, for instance, for flight versus an iPhone app. So um, it was more of a comment, but do you have any um, response or comment back on that? Or Amber, if there's anything you would like to uh, add to that comment. And um, David, this is Marilyn. Okay. I, I would ask what Amber means by performance changes in usability. I, I'm not sure I understand the comment. Uh, she says she was thinking, just add another comment. I was thinking of human factors implications within the flight service station. So um, 
And Amber, if you're comfortable, if, if you want to go off mute and just speak directly to Marilyn there, um, and, and that way maybe we can clarify what, um, what you were looking for. Sure. Hi, Marilyn. This is Amber. Hi, Amber. Um, for the performance, I was just kind of thinking how, if they would perform better with their briefings, say on like ForeFlight versus another third party application or if they would find that they did a more thorough job i guess would be the better answer on one application versus another because potentially that could be used as a standardization if flight service were to morph into say a, a different domain for the future if that makes sense it does that's very interesting it's a little bit out of the scope uh, for the ac I know that Gary will probably speak to uh, some of the studies that, that he's done. I know we do at the FAA have human factors folks who look at these. It would be an interesting comparison to see how uh, people do with self-briefing using third-party resources uh, versus flight service. Um, yeah, I don't have any data. I'll talk about that a little, Marilyn, in my briefing. We have actually done some comparisons um, between third party, and I'm going to talk a little about the study we're doing between uh, specialist briefings and self briefings. We'll talk about that in my presentation, and I can touch on then a little bit of the study we did that compared the third party briefings and some of the human factors of it. Um, I don't have that in the chart, but I can address that in my briefing as well because it kind of relates to what I'm presenting. So we have done some studies on that, but the uh, third party to third party is a little out of date um, and maybe worth redoing. And I'll talk about some of those. I can mention some of those findings as I talk about the study we're doing now comparing um, third party and self briefings to specialist briefings. Okay, thank you Thanks, very much. Gary. Appreciate it. Thanks, Gary, um, and we'll stand by for that. Uh, there is one other question that just came in from uh, uh, Thomas Gwynn. Uh, is AC9192 intended to replace the 2006 uh, General Aviation Pilots Guide to Pre-Flight Weather Planning, Self-Briefings, and uh, Weather Decision-Making? Uh, the answer to that, Thomas, is I believe that that guide has been sunsetted, although you can still find it online, but it, it was sunsetted. All right, thank you. All right, it sounds like that's uh, all the questions we have at this moment. So um, Matt or, or Janet, I'll shoot it back to y'all for now. Okay, thank you. Thank you, David. Then I'll, um, I'll go ahead and share my screen and we will do the video and then afterwards we'll take a 10 minute break. Then after the 10 minute break, then we will hear um, from Joe Donnelly and he will talk about the changes in the delivery of flight service. Keeping my fingers crossed for you, Janet. I know, me too. Flight Service celebrated its 100-year anniversary last summer. What a history we have had in the expansion of aviation to what it is today. I have a great sense of pride in the things we do to safely and efficiently meet the needs of our pilots and our stakeholders. We are committed to continue evolving and modernizing to meet the needs of the aviation community. Now let's hear from some of the people from D.C. to Alaska who span the nation in our wide world of flight service. There are 17 flight service stations in Alaska spread out over a large geographical area. From Barrow, the northernmost tip of the state, to Cold Bay on the Aleutian Chain, to Ketchikan on the southeast panhandle. These services are offered to general aviation, air carrier, air taxi, military, the law enforcement, airport management, and other air traffic facilities. Alaska Flight Service continues to deliver operational excellence in the delivery of services to the national airspace system. Due to Alaska's reliance on aviation and the limited infrastructure, it has been home to many innovative programs to enhance aviation safety. Some of these programs include the capstone, weather cameras, and the one I am most familiar with, 
the Enhanced Special Reporting Service. Participating in the ESRS program provides pilots the option of using portable electronic GPS tracking devices to provide aircraft position information when the traditional means are unavailable. These tracking devices provide the flight service specialist a last reported position should the aircraft become overdue on a flight plan. The pilot or the service provider may also initiate an SOS or distress message that goes directly to flight service and triggers immediate search and rescue actions. Many of these satellite-based tracking devices have two-way texting capabilities. Our next big challenge is to incorporate two-way texting into our operational equipment. Alaska Flight Services continue to leverage current technology to enhance aviation safety in Alaska. The ESRS program is a great example of this innovation. Weather cameras, that's what we do here. Since we put the cameras in now, safety has increased dramatically. We have 230 camera sites with uh, three to four cameras at each site. We have about a thousand cameras total that the FAA manages. And then we also are hosting cameras from NAV Canada, about 275 sites. Nobody leaves the ground before they've looked at the weather cameras. From our humble beginnings as Department of Commerce air mail radio stations, we have needed trained personnel to operate and provide services to the pilots and the flying public. One of the important topics that we teach our students here deals with Alaska dependence on aviation. We are responsible for conducting the initial flight service training for controllers, transferring from FAA towers and en route centers, military controllers, and new hires with no controller background. Our group, the Safety and Operations Group, is responsible for developing new flight service policy and applying business acumen to policy questions that may arise. In order for new policy to be extended to the operational world, safety work is required. Our staff is trained in the SMS process and provides advice to the change proponent seeking to make changes to the NAS. Some of the exciting work that's been actively occurring within our group includes the modernization of the NOTAM system, development of UAS weather and flight planning requirements in collaboration with flight standards and the National Weather Service, the implementation of graphical weather displays within flight service, and improvements in flight planning communications between NAV Canada's and our operating systems. Primary functions uh, of my team are to provide QA oversight for the LIDOS Future Flight Service Program contract. And we also work alongside our FAA flight service partners up in Alaska to provide QA oversight for the AFSIAC. In addition to flight service functions, we've recently been designated uh, performance management functions for the Center Weather Service Unit IAA. Uh, we perform what we call systems and facilities coordination or SIFAC functions, which is sort of a liaison function between LIDOS, the contractor, and FAA entities. So a new file on contract was awarded. It was a full and open competition, which was awarded to the incumbent service provider LIDOS which improved efficiencies and uh, reduced costs. For perspective, uh, the AFSS contract was in excess of $2 billion. The Future Flight Service team is responsible for providing oversight of the services provided by the vendor, as well as improving the uh, delivery of flight service for the flying public. Current capabilities include local area knowledge, which is a new tool that is collecting the information from within a specialist head and sharing it with the pilot, and also making it easier to access uh, for other specialists. We've increased redundancy so that the system doesn't go down as frequently, which both improves the experience for the pilot and the specialist, as well as other users of the NAS. So the biggest uh, activity that we're trying to provide is actually providing the first voice over internet protocol air to ground communication system in the NAS. So um, voice over IP is what you use on a day to day basis when you're working on teams and we're trying to uh, use that same technology for air to ground communications with flight service specialists. We're also increasing uh, the cybersecurity posture, uh, which is essentially just making it more secure and, and compliant with the, the FISMA high compliance standards that uh, have been set for the system. ASSE is working on solutions to improve flight service operations in Alaska, as well as ensuring its viability for the next generation of users. As we celebrate 100 years of flight service, I can't help but look back at the changes that have occurred 
The internet, cell phones, tablets, all have changed how stakeholders utilize our services. Many of the changes ASSE is evaluating will modernize the aging Alaska infrastructure and equipment still in use today. These are just a few of the people, programs, and projects that represent the heart of flight service. As we continue to celebrate our history together and expand as one flight service, we are going to align our organization and our resources in such a way that will determine and provide future services, modernize our infrastructure, and build a team that will help shape the next century of flight services. By building trust among our employees, we empower them to be a part of this vision and share in the excitement of what the future of flight service will be. Okay, thank you. Um, we'll take a break now until 12.25. Um, I, I think that um, definitely the first question, the concept of the legal briefing versus the certified briefing is real and defined by the FAA. It's definitely one of the questions that Marilyn um, addressed and hopefully um, there's more clarification around that question. Um, now that she um, she has clarified that, that there's um, no such thing as a legal briefing. Um, she definitely spoke to that. Um, I don't know if Mar Marilyn, are you back on the call? Yes, I am. I'm here. Okay, so that was a, that's pretty interesting considering that um, the responses were um, dead even. Yeah, I, I looked at that. That was surprising when I saw it. Um, a certified and a legal briefing. Um, I'm not sure that uh, why people are so hung up about that. And I will say that I'm still seeing comments. Um, one particularly someone sent an email and said that uh, saying that in the AC where we talk about the briefings and self briefings that it may be compliant. This individual said, well, that's that's just a cop out and that's legalese from the FAA. And, and really it isn't if you think about it. You know, why would there be a concept of a legal briefing identified and be so um, prescriptive as to not be considering the variance in pilots and equipment and all sorts of other things? Hmm. Right. And I think the other one that we um, actually were looking at as well was um, the um, on the next the next page. If you could um, go to the next page, I believe it was um, the the pilot may use third party online pre flight planning applications to be compliant. I believe I think that's the one. I don't know. I believe Jim was mentioning one. Jim, are you on the line? I'm here. Yes. OK, what was the other one that you thought was interesting as far as the outcome? Oh, um, well, I think on the prior slide, um, obviously, uh, question number one. Right. And there was, was another one. And, th and then number three, too, um, you know, there was obviously some, you know, some thought, too, that that still need to be digitally logged or recorded. And, and you know, the reality is uh, the, the fact that these are confusing topics is because these terms have lived for, you know, for decades, right, out there that you need to get a legal briefing. And, and so um, the, the fact that, you know, that, that it's still not clear uh, is why we, we're doing these, these projects, right? And, and to try to get the word out there um, and get everyone consistent on the same page. So this, this is very insightful for us. Um, and I think I think the intent was to run it again at the end, right? To make sure everyone got the That's message. Correct. Yeah, correct. And, and there's no and, wrong answer, right? Like you know, if you right. if you think a legal briefing is a, is a real thing, it's probably because you've been told that somewhere along the, the way. And, and you know, what we're trying to do is is really make everyone understand is that it, it you know the goal is for you to be compliant with you know the, the 91103 and the AC helps you see how to be compliant. And to, to Marilyn's point, um, you can you can call flight service and not pay attention to what they're doing or you can go online and not pay attention uh, and you're not compliant because you didn't really check what you were supposed to check. So the whole goal is it, it's you know we want to teach you what it is you need to do to be safe and, and compliant. Uh, and it's your job to make sure you do those things and you know check the things that are relevant and, and make sure you draw a good conclusion. 
Right. And Jim, if I could add to, you know, number three, the question about the recording um, or a digital log. I think part of the issue here is that in compliance and enforcement, when the FAA is conducting an enforcement action, looking into something that happened, be it an incident or an accident, one of the areas the FAA does look at is was the pilot on a flight plan? Did the pilot get a pre-flight briefing? Those are contributing areas to resolving uh, that Swiss cheese of, of how did the pilot end up in, in such a situation? What contributed? So did the pilot get a weather briefing is one area that can be answered by having a recorded briefing. But that doesn't necessarily make it a compliant briefing. It's recorded. The other areas that that can be looked at was the pilot participating in the WINGS program. Did the pilot uh, have a, a recent flight review? Is the pilot medically qualified? Did the pilot uh, participate in any other sort of things? And how much time does the pilot have? How much time in the recent past, is the pilot someone who flies regularly or flies a few times a year? So the fact that uh, a recorded briefing is utilized as part of the picture, it doesn't really lend toward whether or not there's an action against a pilot, if you will. Uh, is the pilot compliant and meeting the reg by having a recorded briefing? It's really part of the whole picture of why did an event happen? How can we back up and look at all of the information to discover what the problem was? Right, but but to be clear, not to confuse anyone, the FAA does not require that a that there be a digital record that the briefing took place. Right. So if if I want yeah. to go out and use my uh, interactive maps on Lidos's you know website, or if I want to use four flights you know graphical maps or aviationweather.gov's GFA. Um, you know, I haven't logged into GFA, but I can get all the information for a weather briefing. It's not recorded uh, digitally, right? Because I didn't log in. There's no record of it. But uh, you know, that's okay though, because we're telling the, the you know the pilots if you if that's your your tool of preference, the GFA on aviationweather.gov, and you get all the information you need, that's fine. You don't have to have a digital record that you did it. That's true. You could even use Matt Franzek Weather Station. Absolutely. Yeah, baby. Yes, uh, one of my personal and, favorites. And, and 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 let's hand it back to Janet, who I know is chomping at the bit to get going on time here. But I will <laughs> leave you with with one hint. Jim Hazeman said something about a uh, a another crack at the survey. Yes, indeed. At the end of the meeting, there'll be one more crack at the survey, and we we'd love you all to take it so that we can see if if this sort of briefing has helped improve your knowledge. Over to you, Janet. Absolutely, absolutely. So um, our next presenter will be um, Joe Dinelli from um, Lidos, and he, he will be discussing the changes in the delivery of flight service. Um, so Joe, um, thank you, and you can present at this time. Let me know when <clears throat> you can see the presentation. Yes, And I'm we can. assuming there's no feedback. We're all good. Everything's good. No feedback. Great. OK, I'm Joe Danielli. Um, we've been talking about flight service and the changes we've made over the past uh, several years. Um, we've all known that um, self briefing is, was going to come to fruition at some point in time. So we started working early on uh, building capabilities for the pilots uh, through automation. Some of the things I want to chat about today, um, a lot of the a lot of the first three things were, were covered already. Uh, which is good, so I don't have to spend a lot of time on them. But you know, why do pilots call flight service? Which leads into, you know, the AC 9192 that was just uh, published. Um, third bullet there. That's really merely a shout out to the uh, to the FAA for putting this um, course together. I took the course really well uh, designed. Um, <clears throat> good job. Uh, mo most important here, I think, is the fourth bullet paradigm shift from pull to push. Um, and we're going to get into this in detail, but historically, um, when I started flying, I, I, I pulled information from flight service. I called and got information. Now we are now sending information to the pilots, which is, you know, a, a, a huge change. 
um, where we've added tools that assess flight conditions, help the uh, pilot uh, to make it their go no go decision. Um, local area knowledge. Uh, somebody spoke about that a little bit earlier. Um, how do you get what's inside a specialist head and put it in in, in an automated state? And we'll, we'll discuss that a little bit. And customer relations management. Uh, it's a tool that we provided the specialists. So when pilots do call in, they're, they're uh, more informed about uh, the individual who's calling in. And if I have time, um, we'll talk about some automated flight planning and briefing tools. Um, We'll, we'll take that on. All right, um, Janet, before I start, um, do you want me to keep this to the 25 minutes or do you want me to cut it down? Uh, it's your call. No, go ahead. Go ahead and do your presentation. We're good. OK, thank you. I just thought if we were short on time, I would uh, adjust accordingly. Um, so why do pilots call flight service? Um, uh, there are a, a number of ACs that, that talk about calling flight service, uh, visiting flight service. The AIM talks about it. Um, uh, the bottom line is the pilot is responsible uh, for obtaining all the information they need to to make an informed decision on whether they're going to fly or not fly. Uh, no matter what a flight service specialist tells you, which is spot on, um, it, it, it's really incumbent upon the pilot. And I, I think we all need to understand that. There, there's a lot of chatter about legal and compliant. And, you know, funny story, when I was putting this together, I spoke to my son who I taught how to fly, and he's now a military pilot. I talked to him, I said, so Joe, why do you call flight service? And he looked at me kind of funny and said, what are you talking about, Dad? And I said, really, why do you call flight service? And he goes, well, you made me. It was the rule. If, you, if I didn't, I, I wasn't getting a legal briefing and I wasn't legal to fly. So it dawned on me right then and there. This is ingrained in everybody's head that, you know, from instructors to flight schools, that they're taught to to provide a, to, to call flight service. No harm, no foul, but that's the paradigm. Um, and I, I slowly, I think over time this will change, but this is not happening overnight. It's just not going to. Um, and the other reason we call are for last minute checks uh, for TFRs and NOTAMs. Um, they're huge. Uh, and 9192, um, uh, Marilyn gave a, a, a tremendous overview of this, so I'm not going to spend a lot of time on it. But the, what 9192 does is it gives you a, a great tools and guidelines for, for planning flights and, and interpreting weather. Um, and identifying risks, but more importantly, and I think the FAA did a great job on this, is how to mitigate those risks. Okay, I can identify a problem, but how do I mitigate that that issue? How, you know, how do we resolve that problem? Um, and normally, it comes down to a go no go decision, or do I delay my flight, or do I go out earlier? Um, there's a lot of factors in there. Um, the bottom line here is 91-92 wants, want pilots, wants pilots to become uh, more familiar with, with aviation weather, um, make their own decisions. <clears throat> and that last bullet down there is really important. It says encourages pilots to use flight service when they need to, um, not as your first um, you know, course of action, but take your time to do things and uh, looking at whether and get the information you need. And then if you're struggling, call flight service. What I'm going to talk about later on is what we've done in flight service to help pilots become self briefers. Um, there are uh, what we've done is taking what flight service specialists do to help a pilot plan flights and file flights, and we've put that in our automation. And I'll show you just a few examples of, of, of those types of things. Um, <clears throat> this is a slide out of the um, out of the course. Uh, I, there, there's lots of slides, and I, I wanted to just focus on this one um, just for a moment or two. Um, but it really sets up a strategy for pilots. Um, I think Marilyn mentioned it, uh, checklists. I mean, pilots live and die by checklists. And what the FAA did 
was set this training up and self briefing um, by checklist. Um, again, we live and die by checklist, so I thought it was a great, a great um, addition or the way they structured this. Um, they want you to talk to your CFI um, or any you know, flight instructor to, to compare notes on weather products on what you're seeing versus what flight service may be telling you. Um, and then as you get as you hone your skills, um, you become a, a, a better brief, a, a better self briefer. Uh, at, at the end of the day, there may be things that you see in the weather that um, you just are not able to to um, pilots are just not able to um, figure out what, what what the pattern is. Um, I, I've been flying for 30 years and there are still things that I see that you know make me scratch my head and, and I, I pick up the phone and, and I call flight service. But that's that's as a la that's as a last resort. I, I do everything through through automation now. Um, and that's just the way things are moving. Um, what I do want to point out, and I think Marilyn pointed it out too, there are no standards um, for presenting uh, weather and aeronautical information, period. Um, so what you see from vendor A versus vendor B versus flight service are completely and could be completely different. I'm not saying they absolutely are, but there are definite differences in the way vendors publish their information. Uh, we provide a lot of the information that you see from other vendors but it's 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 their website. They have the ability to render that and display it the way they want. Um, just know everything that you see on our website um, when you get a, a a briefing. And again, the compliance thing. Um, we do record everything. Um, whatever a spec, whatever a pilot looks at, is is recorded. And you know, we get a lot of questions at at, at air shows and things like that. You know, you know, is it, am I legal to fly? And 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 I. I, I have to remind the pilot that there's nothing that qualifies as you know, legal. Um, it's your responsibility to get all the information, but I do tell them when you hit that brief button, that standard brief button on the flight serv on, on the flight service website, you are obtaining all the information you need to make a, an informed judgment. So the follow-up question was, well, why do you even bother recording it? Well, in case we ever are called, you know, you, you ever are challenged. Uh, by the FAA or whomever, um, we have a record of it to show that yes, you did get a, a briefing and yes, there were, were no TFRs <clears throat> at that moment. So things like that. <clears throat> it's not that it makes it legal. It, it helps defend your case. I think more than anything else, it, it makes your case that that you did go out and get a, a standard briefing for your flight. So uh, excellent course. So paradigm shift. We're going to move from pulling information to pushing information. The, one of the first things we implemented early on was <clears throat> something called adverse condition alerting service. I spoke a little bit about it earlier. You would call flight service, they would tell you the conditions, <clears throat> and after that, unless you called back, you didn't know what was going on with that route of flight. This, we have a service now, flight service will send you, <clears throat> if a TFR pops up along your route of flight, if convective SIGMETs pop up, uh, air METs, things like that, closed runways, and we'll send those to you um, by text or, or email. So not that you don't have to call back, what we'll do is send that information to you, and you can have that information sent to you two hours before your flight, one hour before, you can start having it sent six hours before your flight. Um, over on the right-hand side of the screen, <clears throat> that is just a depiction of an air met that um, uh, came across one of my flights uh, going from Orlando up to Duke Field. Um, <clears throat> it, it, that's an indication to me if I'm flying VFR, um, or if my plans were to fly VFR, that I may rethink that flight. So. Uh, you log in, you do a briefing, and, and you get more details. But the bottom line is we are not telling pilots when adverse conditions are popping up the, along their route of flight. Um, we have something called a briefing condition alerting service. You get a briefing, we will send you <clears throat> updates to any aspect of the briefing. Uh, METARs come in, we'll send them to you, anything. A NOTAM pops up, um, doesn't have to be an adverse condition, it'll be any 
any aspect of a briefing that has changed, we can send it to you Im immediately so you have an idea of what is going on with your route of flight. Flight plan updates from ATC. This is, you know, this is huge. I mean, rather than waiting to get to the, you know, to the field to pick up your clearance, we're telling you now that ATC has changed your flight. You log in, update your flight plan, and, and you're good to go. Now you're cleared as filed. Again, we're sending this information to the pilots rather than them having to call in at the last minute and saying, hey, uh, this is Joe D. I'm, uh, you know, November 123. Any changes to, to my flight? And they don't have to do that anymore. So we will send them updates from ATC. This is another, I love this feature, scheduled email briefings. Um, I normally typically plan a flight uh, night before. <clears throat> Fine, you know, if I'm leaving 8 o'clock in the morning. I can schedule an email briefing to be sent to me at 6 a.m., 7 a.m. I take a look at it, and if everything still looks good, I'm good to go. I don't have to call flight service for a last minute check. <clears throat> Everything's in there. Uh, handy. And we also push closed reminders. Um, if you haven't had not closed your flight plan um, 20 minutes after your arrival time, we'll, we'll, we'll push a notice to you and say, hey, um, just a reminder, close your flight plan. Uh, search and rescue is incredibly expensive. Um, so we want to, you know, nip that in the bud before it happens. Last thing, this is technically not a push, but what I wanted to do, um, I added this um, after seeing the video. <clears throat> Alaska has their um, um, an enhanced uh, reporting for search and rescue. Uh, we have the same thing down here in the lower 48 uh, using um, re position reporting devices. Uh, this is incredible. We love it. Um, you have one of these devices, it's free. Um, it's a free service that we offer, uh, whatever the uh, the, whatever uh, the, those particular companies charge, that's that's different. But the, the point here is you go on a flight plan, you activate your flight plan, you'll start sending us little breadcrumbs of where you are in the sky. And if we happen to stop re getting those reporting, you know, those reports, we will initiate search and rescue. So now we're not, ser flight service is not waiting until 30 minutes overdue, <clears throat> we will start search and rescue immediately when we stop um, getting those or picking up those position reports, those little breadcrumbs. So again, just another feature or something that has changed dramatically in, in, in flight service. Right, so I talked about tools to assess flight conditions. Um, we have a multitude of Flight services added a, a, a ton of things to, to help um, pilots make decisions, uh, go no go decisions. Um, <clears throat> what I wanted to do is pull out a few just to, uh, to 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 show the types of things that that is available through available through flight service uh, automation. Um, the bottom line is <clears throat> we have to make pilots comfortable and confident that what they're looking at um, they can assimilate, they can assess flight planning situations. Um, if they can't do that, then we failed. Um, they're going to pick up the phone and call flight service, period. Um, so what we've done, we've enhanced our online briefing capabilities big time. Um, we've reduced the size of textual briefings. You literally can take a 25 mile flight and get a 70 page briefing. Um, <clears throat> I have briefings from when I first started flying the old teletypes, and they are pages and pages and pages of coded text. It's just daunting. Um, we provide more graphics. <clears throat> uh, excuse me. Uh, <clears throat> you know, the adage, picture's worth a thousand words. I mean, it really is. Um, you can see by the two images below, um, the one on the left shows uh, a TFR, that's aircraft departing Orlando, that's the Walt Disney World TFR right there, and the up on the north of the panhandle, that's a Tallahassee TFR. So I, I and, and the Tallahassee TFR is incredibly close to my route of flight. So uh, this this gives me an indicator um, that I've got two TFRs along my route of flight. I need to be cognizant of them. Obviously, the briefing will tell me when they're active and things like that. But this gives me a very quick in, a visual of of what's there. 
Uh, the, the image on the right is a picture of uh, the um, the METAR, uh, the, the conditions, uh, the observations along the route of flight. Again, very quick visual of, of what the conditions are at that moment in time. Um, obviously, uh, looking at a TAF uh, will help you uh, uh, simulate the, the data and assess the conditions at your destination better. We have next generation briefings. We uh, filter, we allow you to filter, and I'm going to show you, we allow you to filter unnecessary information. Um, I, you know, I'm, I'm flying not at 53,000 feet. As a matter of fact, my airplane can't get to 53,000 feet, but we are required to give you this information. Um, so we give you the ability to filter things out that are way above your altitude in flying. Uh, we give you the ability to, um, or not give you the ability, we calculate penetration times into say airmets and TFRs and SIGMETs and things like that. And I'll show you that in a minute too. Uh, these are all aids that, that help the pilot uh, quickly assess what's going on uh, weather-wise and aeronautically um, you know, uh, along the route of flight. I talk briefly about customizing briefings. Um, this is just a, a screenshot of, of, of something that we allow or we present to the pilot to to reduce the amount of information that is presented. Um, the more information you throw at a pilot or have a pilot look at, the less they're going to remember. Um, and again, I, I, I don't want to look at a 75 page briefing or a 50 page briefing. I don't even want to look at a 20 page briefing. I, I want to look at things that quickly assess my flight conditions. So there are things that we allow you to that that the FAA has allowed us to put in this system um, to filter, say, filter winds aloft. You know, I'll, I'll only sh uh, show you winds within 4,000 feet of your filed altitude. Um, en route nav notams. Uh, you know, if I'm a VFR pilot, I, I don't need ILS notams along my route of flight. I don't think anybody flies NDBs anymore. Um, you know, if you're not military, you don't need TAC and notams and things like that. So you select what you want to see, and it reduces the amount of information that you that 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 you have to remember. Um, I can argue if I'm if I'm an IFR pilot, I don't need ILS modems along my route of flight. I mean, unless I, I'm not planning on shooting any approaches into airports along my route. So there are things that you can definitely get rid of, um, and including optional briefing products like flow control messages and hurricane bulletins and things like that. State Department modems. Um, you don't need to see, you know, if I'm VFR, I absolutely don't need flow control messages. So there are things that you just don't need in your briefing. Again, reduce the amount of information, helps the pilot to assimilate the information and assess their flight um, conditions uh, quicker. Uh, another tool we have here, this is, um, this is showing um, uh, a low turb air met uh, along my route of flight. And if I was, you know, if I call flight service, what they would tell me is, okay, Joe, uh, looks good in the beginning here, but maybe the last 30 or flight, you're going to in, in, in encounter some some turbulence. That's that's excellent. I mean, this is one of the flights I took, um, and this is what a specialist would would tell me. What we've done is we've translated that into into uh, the website um, and how we deliver information through automation. If I switch to the next screen, what I've done is I've, I've focused in on those two particular airmets. There were two airmets in there, two uh, turbo airmets. You can see that the top airmet is going to be active during the time I'm going, I'm scheduled to pass that into that or enter into that, that airmet. Um, the top gives me a, a summary of what that airmet is rather than me having to read through the coded information down below. Um, gives me a summary of that airmet, and that red icon indicates that it's going to be active when I plan on being there. Based that's based on my departure time, my aircraft performance characteristics, and the winds aloft. So I clearly know that if I depart at the time I said it was going to, I'm going to hit that airmet. I may not want to. Um, conversely, the airmet on the bottom. Um, based on the time I'm going to get there and things like that, it's telling me that that particular airmet is going to end 60 minutes before I get there. Um, 
So that's the green icon indicates that is it is not going to be an impact. Now, if I delay my flight or something like that, obviously that you know that'll um, be taken into account. But these are tools that the specialists or things that the specialists would tell you. Yep, that airman's going to be hot when you're there, or it's going to be active. You may want to delay your flight or go earlier. Same thing with the bottom one. Looks like it's pretty good. So we've taken information that a specialist would tell you and presented it to the pilot. Uh, somebody mentioned local area knowledge earlier. Um, um, actually, it was on the video. John Herman from the FAA <clears throat> talked about local area knowledge and, and how do we tap information um, from, a, from a specialist. And this is exactly what we did on the, uh, for this particular um, feature that we have both available to the specialist and to the pilot. We've reduced, we, we now have two facilities. The humans are all there and they're, they all have their local area knowledge from, from where they came from. And, but now they're also required maybe to take on briefing, cap, briefing uh, into, uh, from other areas or into other areas that maybe they're not familiar with. Well, we've given them tools and the specialists and the pilots to actually look up area specific information. Um, and you can read those things that we have there, but we, we display these things for the pilot so they can quickly see some of the things that are, are, are there um, in that local area, uh, especially if they're like me flying in from out of town. Like Sun and Fun was just last week. Um, we had a lot of pilots coming in from out of town. Um, and actually talking to some pilots, they actually use this local area knowledge because it helped them set up and, and arrive into Lakeland, you know, um, safely. Uh, they were able to pick up frequencies from here. They were able to pick up um, uh, special land features and stuff like that. Thank goodness Florida is relatively flat. Nothing, nothing hazardous there. But the point is, what we've done is we've taken information that was embedded or is ingrained in specialists from the local areas that, that they were very familiar with. And we've we've put it all into um, automation and drop downs and just point and click and and you, you can easily get that information. Um, even air even airspace procedures um, and, and FAA regulations. We we've added all that information into this map uh, for the pilot. This is a snapshot of our interactive map um, on the flight service uh, website. Let's see. Customer relations management. Um, this is a, a, a an, an incredibly neat little tool that that was developed for specialists. Um, when a pilot calls in, if they have an account and, and we recognize their phone number, a, a pop up um, appears and it has all the information that you see. This way, a specialist understands, OK, this guy's got, you know, 5,000 hours, 7,000 hours of flying time um, versus, OK, he's a student pilot. He's got 10 hours of flying time. Helps them, uh, you know, maybe tailor is a better word, is a good word, tailor the briefing to to the experience level of the pilot. Um, our specialists do an incredible job of um, taking their time with, with student pilots and, and helping them along the way. The pop-up also shows the current and recent flight plan. So if they're calling in, you know, that they have a current flight plan on file, maybe they're calling in, gives them the heads up that maybe they're calling in to activate. So boom, they, they're, they're done. Uh, they can look up their history real quick. Um, and it'll also give them an updated briefing. Uh, so things to streamline what a specialist does uh, while he's on the phone with a pilot. Um, and just tools at uh, the top, uh, more specifically the local area knowledge for the pilots that help them assimilate the information and, and digest it, uh, local information a lot quicker um, uh, using the interactive map. Uh, Janet, can I get a time check? Um, it is 12.59. All right. Um, Ten more minutes? Um, Five? Um, five more minutes is fine. Okay. <laughs> All right. 
So we have a, a number of automated flight planning and briefing tools. Um, and again, if you look at the, the second bullet there, flight planning tools, we've added tools to help pilots plan their, their route of flight, uh, to help evaluate their departure time, uh, to optimize the altitude that they're going to fly on, and then um, a whole, uh, just a number of automated tools. Because uh, when I call in or a pilot calls in, Specialists help them plan their route from from departure to destination. Our site allows that and, and helps them do that. Um, a specialist will also tell them, hey, Joe, you know, you you're planning on leaving at you know, 9 a.m. Well, it doesn't look so good. Your departure station looks good. Destination is going to is going to turn IFR. Um, not 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 so good. Um, so they need they may need to rethink that and let me I want to go to this tool here. This is evaluate your departure time. If I schedule a flight, say at 2100, 9 p.m., uh, what that does is it tells me what my flight conditions look like from departure to destination. Um, it, it, this, is this is based on um, the terminal area forecast, and it's giving me the conditions that are forecasted to be at, say, Pierre. Uh, South Dakota, um, based on my departure time, winds aloft and aircraft characteristics. So if I'm an IFR pilot, okay, this one looks good. I may delay my flight till 10 p.m., 2200, because um, there's no IFR conditions along the route. If I'm a VFR pilot, I may rethink this one altogether. This is not a substitute for a, a briefing, but this is what the specialist would, would help you, you know, ascertain, ascertain very quickly. Uh, okay, your IFR pilot. Okay, you are going to hit some IFR conditions along your route, and and they let you know that this is a snapshot of what the conditions look like. That's optimizing your altitude. We will give you fuel burn and estimated time on route. Uh, you can then select uh, if you want to go higher, or lower, or things like that. Um, based on your on route time, you want to save a little bit of fuel or whatever, I like to fly high, so I'm not going to be coming down at all. Um, so in closing, we allow, we, we, are, we, we are pushing information to the pilot. Um, we have created automation tools to help the pilot satisfy, I believe, the, the requirements and, well, not requirements, but the goals and guidelines set forth in AC 9192 by giving them the tools to do this, by being able to brief, being able to see the adverse conditions, uh, quickly assimilating that information. We can we allow them to file on, on, through our automation, amend flight plans. They can, something called easy activate, they can activate online and they can close online. So we've given the pilot the ability to do everything from as if they were calling a specialist to present the information and in a manner which we believe helps them uh, assimilate the information, determine uh, if they have uh, you know, good flight conditions uh, and for them to make a, an informed um, uh, go no go decision. Uh, with that, uh, thank you uh, for allowing me to take uh, you know, 30 minutes of your time and, and talk about flight service. Um, Thank you very much, Janet. Back to you. Thank you very much, Joe. You're welcome. So at this time, we will hear from Jim Hazeman. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm just going to share my screen here. Give me one second. OK, is that, uh, is that presenting? Yes, it is. OK, so uh, welcome to FPA. I'm going to speak a little bit about the educational aspect of our stakeholder engagement. Uh, before I get into the actual education material, just want to spend a little bit of uh, time uh, on the kind of the background reinforce some of the things we've already um, heard w when we were looking at um, you know the the uh, the future of of the um, the the contract if you, if you remember like John Herman mentioned in the video that um, you know there's a new contract in place so when we were preparing for the future 
we saw that you know the pilots were telling us that they they really liked they you know automation they were moving to automation and we, we saw that in in really the demand um if you kind of envision on this graph here that the green line the, the this being representing like the demand of calls that were coming in uh, and they could be calls for weather briefings or flight plan activations or closing things like that but the demand was dropping year over year uh and then the capacity if it was represented kind of like this darker line as a you know represented by the specialist capacity to handle those calls we saw that we had, um, you know, really enough capacity to handle that. So, um, and in this, in this environment, you know, pilots were experiencing very good customer service, you know, um, and, and short wait times. Uh, however, as we started looking forward to, you know, how the FA was going to, um, you know, kind of dedicate assets and, and funds toward future flight service, uh, you know, why? Why put more uh, capacity if it's not being requested? So what we saw was that 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 demand was going down, but at the same time it was projected to actually go down faster, and and that was really going to be attributed to things like that, that Joe just talked about, uh, the CRM, um, you know, applications. So you know, knowing what a pilot did before he calls, knowing his background, that that shortens the call, so that ultimately lowers the demand. So. We recognize that that this was probably going to be the trend going forward. Uh, however, the, the kind of the challenging part of this was in planning for the future flight services program. The flight service capacity was going to be budgeted now for the years going forward. So it was important to make sure that we, you know, that we obviously got that right. So the, the goal was obviously to, to kind of have this the capacity kind of go down with the demand, uh, and then of course at some point anticipating a level leveling off because there's always going to be some demand for for flight service, even if it's in, in a different form. Format, like if it's more consultative, as we if we talked about in the prior presentations, um, you know, pilots are calling in just to check one thing. They're still calling, so you still have to have capacity there to handle uh, that demand. However, there was the question that was kind of posed by us: is that uh, does this risk um, exist? that if the calls don't decline as as anticipated in in you know future years 5 10 you know 15 years if, if we if we got that wrong what would happen and obviously what would happen is we'd kind of represented by this line here you would see that all of a sudden now the the demand exceeds the capacity and that results in longer wait times which is something we we didn't want so that so we, we kind of looked in, at this as from a risk management perspective and said okay that's a potential risk um is that risk real? Because we wanted to make sure that we accounted for, you know, mechanisms to to offset it. So what we found is that there really was a problem. There was a risk that we might be introducing impediments because we had, as we've heard from the other presentations, um, inconsistent messages out there. One website would say not to be used for flight planning. You have to call documents, the aim, you know, you name them. Uh, there were there were we, we knew there were documents out there. Um, we didn't even define what, what meant to be regulatory compliant, what's legal, what's certified, right? All, all these questions existed. Uh, we were still pushing human reliance. So that was really going to work against our own kind of, you know, optimization for the future. Um, and, and we didn't really, you know, weren't informing them how to do, how the pilots would do this. So, so we, we, we found that, yes, there kind of was a problem and it was causing confusion. Uh, myself being a pilot, when I started on this project, I said, you know, to, to my, my peers is, I want to make sure that coming out of this, you can tell me what's a legal briefing, what's a certified briefing, does it exist? Uh, do they have to be recorded? Because I, I was doing my own flight planning, you know, with certain assumptions, but I want to make sure that I, you know, I was not being confused either. And I know other pilots, you know, weren't sure about some of these answers. And even from the, the survey results, we saw that there's, you know, there is still um, a, a lot of um, uncertainty about some of the answers that, um, you know, the FAA would have you uh, know for, for these things. So we we realized that we, you know, we were causing pilot confusion. We were adding the road bumps. We were adding the hot spots, which are confusion areas. Um, and we said, OK, well, I mean, you know, we can certainly work to, to to fix that. Would that be, you know, all we really need to do? Would with that point, would we be able to say, hey, you know, these pilots are cleared to get on the Autobahn of self briefing and travel 300 or 200 miles an hour, 300 kilometers an hour? And we said, no, not so fast, because at that time we were, uh, you know, kind of putting this, 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 all this the strategy together and we were attending FPAW 2018. So just kind of a, you know, um, a, a nod to FPAW uh, as, as be, you know, being very helpful in, in us understanding other aspects about self-briefing uh, that, that existed that were not really about the FAA's confusion or, or impediments, uh, but were more about the pilot's ability to do a self-brief safely. So just very quickly, some slides that existed that we, we, we retained and actually used to help drive some of our goals in, uh, in, in the stakeholder 
older engagement and, and future flight services planning was around these risks. So we saw, you know, from Emory Riddled uh, back in 2018, contributing factors, weather accidents, GA pilots, inability to interpret weather displays, radar being one of the ones that were confusing, you know, maybe inadequate training that was, uh, was there. Um, uh, we saw from uh, Bill Gaw's presentation, uh, three out of 20 pilots had some formal weather interpretation training via classroom, only three out of 20. So that, you know, that could explain some of the, the challenges that were out there. Uh, in Bill's other presentation, uh, from, which he borrowed from the NTSB, 41% of weather-related accidents, the pilot did not obtain or receive an adequate weather briefing. I mean, they did some, but it wasn't adequate. Um, other, other areas that we saw, um, from from you know FPAW 2018 is uh, you know what are the pilots looking at? A lot of new stuff is coming out. Do they know how to use it? Uh, are they looking at the proper resource? Are they seeing the same things that you know, maybe a, a specialist would have looked at if this if they were calling the specialist? Um, another presentation from 2018 from from Emory Riddle. Um, was that uh, pilots had low interpretation scores in some of the research that they did on weather knowledge assessment. And then, you know, probably one of the more concerning ones was this one here, where pilots were given, you know, a, a scenario, a weather briefing, so to speak, and they struggled at the end of that briefing to depict where the weather was along the route, where they were going to encounter dangers, at what point, and, and, and as a result, if you're not able to you know, to understand where you're going to have a challenge, it's very hard to develop a good, you know, no go, no decision. So we we came away from this really understanding that pilots and CFIs weren't being trained, um, you know, kind of effectively and how to do self briefing. Pilots were forgetting, so the process just wasn't gelling. Uh, unlike a specialist, where a specialist follows a process, it's, it's, there's actually a, a, a you know a handbook, a you know, the, the, not a handbook, but actually a regulation in uh, 7110.10 that actually describes how the how the brief the specialist will provide a briefing so that wasn't really uh, clearly existing for um you know for, for the pilots so how, you know how do we address all of these risks right so we had inconsistency we had you know um, messages that were muddled and we had a safety you know potential uh, lack of understanding and, and uh, education on how to do it and that's where the stakeholder engagement project had, had come about um you know very briefly stakeholder engagement was a team of individuals uh, that worked within flight service uh, included flight service um, FAA specialists uh, and, and and past specialists and um, you know operations and safety you know representatives from flight service uh, so a team formed uh, around five initiatives which I'll talk about in a second uh, but what we then realized was you know one of the one of the guidance we got very early on was actually from AOPA that said this is great that you guys want to go out and you know kind of clean this stuff up but it can't be one group it has to be you know a consistent message that comes from uh, all parts of the FAA so if we call flight standards if we call Call safety and ops. If we call ATO safety, if we call legal. We're all going to get the same answer. So it was imperative that the, the stakeholder engagement actually engage all and other parts of the FAA, uh, so that we're all on the same page ourselves. So collaboration. But then an important element was also to make sure that we were communicating and informing stakeholders in, you know, our service providers, light us flight service, third party vendors, associations, make sure everyone was also kind of uh, in the loop on what was going to be happening. Uh, Frankie talked about, uh, you know, this group right here um, and, uh, you know, and then actually ask them, what do you think, right? Get feedback and then use that to uh, develop FAA guidance and policy. So that, that's essentially what stakeholder engagement was. Uh, but the five initiatives were actually, you know, the core part of what we were going to work on to actually solve the problem. So stakeholder engagement was initially the very first thing was define and promote a clear and concise message on self briefing. So that message um, has been defined. It's been promoted uh, and it's in the process of still being promoted. But just to reiterate what Marilyn said, prior to every flight, pilots should gather all information vital to nature of flight. Using automated resources, pilots can conduct a regulatory compliant pre-flight briefing without contacting, contacting flight service. But for pilots who prefer to contact flight service, you're still encouraged to conduct a pre-flight self-briefing first because we want you to, to form those opinions ahead of time. So that message has been defined. It was the very first step of this process. Uh, we're still in the process of promoting it, but that's underway. Second was consistency. Take that message, push it out to all the different documents. Frankie showed us all the, the 31 different documents, websites, handbooks, circulars, You know, basically make sure clean up all of those those items that they all have the consistent and the same message, but then address pilot education, educate the pilots on how to do the self brief, bridge that weather gap, give them some other knowledge in the process, 
and increase their pilot self assessment skills. As Frankie had mentioned in her presentation, uh, if you can make a decision around weather on the ground, that's a skill you can use in the in the air, uh, which is you know increasingly more relevant a skill than say maybe 20 years ago, because now you're getting real time weather in the cockpit and you need to understand uh, you know how to process it. And then two other initiatives we're working on um, that we're not really going to talk too much about, but one is the policy assessment, making sure that the 7110.10 that I mentioned is actually flexible enough so that you know Lightos and, and flight service can um you know, can, can adopt new technologies and, and innovate uh, and, and integrate those technologies. And then lastly, um, you know, looking at the, the data and analysis, uh, you know, that comes out of, um, you know, this whole process and, you know, why are pilots calling and what can we do to, uh, you know, continue to serve them and optimize and improve. So those were the five initiatives. Uh, what I'm going to talk about in the rest of this presentation is the education initiative. So I'm going to focus on that. So education was kind of defined um, around the very first step was to actually educate. So the AC was out there. It was, we knew we were working on it with Marilyn and, and her team. Uh, it was gonna be out there and it was kind of like, you know, direction manual, how to do it. Uh, but we we wanted to build also a, 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 an educational course. And we started with, uh, with students and VFR pilots initially to really provide them with a kind of a, you know, a, a way to apply what was in the AC. Very much like if you, you know, if you buy a, like a camera, you get, a, you get a user's manual that says, you push this button, it does this, and it gives you all this information, but it's not, it doesn't really help you to take good pictures until you really understand how to put all those pieces together, uh, you know, and, and, and that's where the, the, the course and the training come in. So we wanted to, you know, kind of take that AC and, and then give them, you know, practical applications and, and some some guidance. So that, that was the AC. Um, the, the whole thought was in, in the big scheme of things, a pilot would read that AC, uh, however, with the wings course, they could take the wings course as well. So that educates them. But the next step we wanted to do is make sure that that course went on and, re and we were able to reinforce what was in that course throughout their pilot training. And that kind of came along with a component known as a worksheet. So when the student finishes the course, takes that worksheet, downloads it, tells them what he what he learned or she learned, um, and and but also gives them some exercises to work on. And in addition, tells them right up front, take this worksheet, give it to your CFI. CFI now gets the worksheet. Hopefully the CFI knows about the course already, but if not on the on the, on the worksheet, uh, the we can now reinforce and, and promote and engage the CFI because it tells the CFI, hey, there's a companion document out there that you should go read. CFI downloads that, it's on the FAST resource library, and in the companion document, it tells the CFI exactly what the student learned, kind of module by module in the, in the WINGS course, and then gives them even more exercises to work with the student to reinforce and really bring um, self briefing to the training curriculum as, as its own component. And, and one of the things we even say in the class is that pre-flight briefing is just as important as flying skills. So we want to really enforce that, enforce that. And then of course the CFI now uh, being alerted to the CFI, you know, the, C, the companion document and the, the course, uh, you know, is able to better instruct, but also it can inform other CFI peers as well as other students. So this is kind of like the foundation that we put together um, for the for the training, um, you know, kind of st strategy. Um, the end result was a WINGS course. Um, it's titled How to Conduct a Pre-Flight Self-Briefing for Student and VFR Pilots. It was just released um, last month. Um, and it, it's, I'm going to walk you through it in here in a second, but it's, you know, designed to be interactive, give real world examples, try to really reinforce different concepts through different things like videos or, you know, pilot firsthand accounts, um, you know, war stories, so to speak, or hangar flying stories. Um, but really the, the goal was that, you know, the pilot would come away and understand how to perceive and process and, you know, plan for a safe flight and under really, really understanding how self-briefing fits into the, the, the big scheme of things. Um, this is a kind of a diagram of the, uh, or a picture of the wing site from last month where the course was uh, you know featured as a featured course as well as as a hot topic so um what i want to do now is i'm going to kind of jump over and, and kind of show you the three different components so the first one is the actual wings class itself how to conduct pre-flight self-briefings for student and VFR pilots. Okay, so a question for somebody out there. D did the audio come through? Can you hear that? Yes, it yep. did. Yeah. Okay, yes. all right. So, so there is audio. So every slide or just about every slide has some audio. Um, pilot can use this at a self-paced. Um, they can listen to the audio. They can silence it if they want and just read through themselves. I'm going to silence it only so I, it doesn't, I'm not speaking um, over it as we go forward. 
but uh, the class is kind of designed um, with, you know, kind of the, the, the current, you know, state of the art, so to speak, um, uh, approach for, you know, giving the, the students the ability to see the whole curriculum off to the left hand side, uh, see where they've been. Um, the, the, the first thing they they would see is clicking through. They you kind of use the next or previous buttons, but um, you know they can see that there's uh, you know, the different modules that are out there. I, I'm not going to you know force you to listen or read each slide. I just want to show you some of the concepts that we put into the slide. So I'm going to go probably maybe a little bit too quick. Uh, if you, if you saw something on the slide, you'd say I really want to study that slide. So what I'll do though is I'll I'll put in the and the, the comments, um, the link, so you can actually go in and, and uh, take some more time. But uh, I, I will just show you a couple of things that we have in here. So the first slide is um, kind of an overview, provides um, an intro, you know, just gives them an idea of what the different phases are, lets them know that if you click on this little finger, that push the button, uh, you actually get additional content that reinforces. So if you're interested about something, you can, you can drill in. And if you're looking for some real life examples, hanger stories, um, you know, hanger flying stories, you can click on, on, that, on that button there. Um, then the next section is kind of know before you go. It's really uh, about, you know, the kinds of things you need to know, you know, what is pre-flight planning? What do you have to do prior to flying? But we, we start off the section by kind of giving them an introduction to just why this is important. And, you know, number one causal factor of general aviation accidents is inadequate pre-flight preparation and planning. And uh, that's from general aviation news. Uh, and then there's a video so they can actually right from the beginning watch a pre-flight you know planning that that went awry where this pilot actually crashed his airplane and then was you know no one was hurt it was gracious enough to actually do a kind of a youtube uh, segment on it on what he did wrong so uh, kind of reinforces right off the bat um you know why why you need to do this it is real and it can happen even to an experienced pilot the next thing we do is we kind of we go over what is pre-flight planning so we define it just to make sure this these are students right so we want to make sure that they understand what the what the activity is uh, then we, we get into why is weather important? Um, you know, sometimes pilots don't understand the different aspects of, of, of weather or even uh, aeronautical information that can affect their flight. And so we give them, you know, give them some high level examples, but if they want to click in, they can actually see, you know, other examples of how this, you know, how these elements are actually going to impact or potentially impact their flight, including things like comfort, you know, making your passengers uncomfortable. So things sometimes that aren't obvious to the student initially. Um, the next thing we do is we we now start to get into you know telling them how they need to start the process. So you know defining your flight weight and balance is an important aspect of that because it you know it affects fuel. So we we reinforce that they can click into this and and you know basically get some more information about weight and balance. We even um, you know, throw in some scenarios to say, listen, just because you're training on one airplane doesn't mean that what you're, what, you know, what works in one will work in another. So we kind of reinforce for their future that as you move to different aircraft. Um, Jim? You know, you have, yeah. Jim, yeah. Um, you're not presenting. I'm not presenting? No, for some reason, the, um, the course is not presenting. Oh, oh, I'm, I'm sorry. Let me, um, let me reshare because that's, uh, I thought it was me, but. And and to, to clarify, at least from my perspective, Jim, I, I, I saw what you were presenting, but maybe what you were presenting wasn't what you were supposed to be presenting or something like that. Yeah, so uh, let me, uh, thanks for telling me to just restart the share. And by the way, Jim, I, I have to I have to comment that um, I, I thought my daughter talked fast and I had to listen really hard to get all her work. But man, you you right there with her. I I'm trying to make sure we cover everything, but if I'm going too fast, just let me know. I, I will no, no, I I love it. All right, so I am representing again, and I'm going to go into the class. Can you see the class now? Yes. 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 Okay. So just very briefly, I was going to show you that it was, um, you know, class starts out. Okay, we can hear it. Pre-flight self-briefings for students. Can you see it? Hear it and see it? Yes. Okay. All right. So yeah, basically um, what you missed was the, uh, you know, kind of the, the modules are laid out here. Um, 
there was an overview section of the of the class where students can see the different modules. They can click on a, this icon to get additional content, real life examples. Um, we cover a, a departure accident as one of our first kind of examples with a video that the pilots can go and see, the students can go and see to kind of reinforce why it was important. Um, we define what pre-flight planning is. We in, kind of reiterate or explain to them why weather is important and aeronautical information is important. We give them examples that they want to drill down into the different things that weather can do from, you know, high temperatures, you know, so um, you know, aircraft performance endurance can be affected by temperatures and winds and thunderstorm. Your ability to control the aircraft can be affected by haze or turbulence. We're really trying to open their eyes as a student, you know, to things that they may not have realized. Um, and the same thing with aeronautical information, we do that. Uh, we tell them to start off with defining their flight. So now we're kind of moving into the process of how to do pre-flight planning. So we tell them, you know, this is all the information you need to do. We reinforce how weight and balance is very important because you know it limits the amount of fuel you can you can carry. And, and we even give them some examples of different weight and balance scenarios that might work for one airplane, it might not work for another. So I think that's kind of where we um, where we were uh, before I realized you couldn't see what I was presenting. So um, I'll just continue on. You can still see the, the, the class, is that right? Yes, yes, you're right. good now. So, all right, so, so the next section then was, um, you know, the, the getting into pre-flight self-briefing. Um, you know, we define what it is, um, and uh, but one of the things we also reinforce is um, what are some of the resources you can use? So we say automated resources, what are they? So we list some of the government resources that are provided, whether, you know, N-100 Weather Brief, aviationweather.gov, TFR, NOTAMS. Uh, but we also uh, let them know their additional resources and further on section. And we, at this point early on in the class, reinforce that commercial third party resources are also commonly used and available um, by the pilots. Uh, the next thing we get into is the types of briefings. So we want to make sure they understand the concept of Outlook standard and abbreviated. Um, we start to introduce the timeframes that you can start using these briefings in advance. Uh, and then we get into, um, and you know, I'm not, like I said, I'm not going to go over every slide, but uh, another important concept uh, was the concept of a checklist. So as Joe had mentioned in his presentation, we're now starting to, we're showing, we're showing the student that it's important to, to have kind of a repeatable process. We kind of relate it back to like how you would configure your airplane, you know, the checklist you would use in your airplane. And we also uh, give them an example of what a checklist would look like filled out because we're trying to reinforce that, you know, we want you to write down which resource you're going to go to, which part of that resource you're going to use and how you're going to configure it. Because that's one of the challenges that we we kind of heard is that, you know, pilots aren't aren't um, following a repeatable process and, and you can make some mistakes if you don't select a certain layer. You think there's no um, adverse conditions out there when in fact there are because you didn't have the right layer selected. Um, next thing we do is, is we introduce, as Joe had pointed out, the transition strategy that says, hey, listen, you know, judge your skill set before you go forward. Uh, we also um, point out a very important concept that the VFR flight not recommended message is not going to be given on automated sites. Currently, it doesn't. It, it's not there. It, it may happen in the future, but 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 if you're if you're kind of calling flight service and you're relying on that VFR not recommended message, you're not going to get it. So it's up to you to make sure and determine whether VFR flight uh, it's going to be safe. The next thing we get into is the phases of flight. So we want to illustrate for the students that they need to understand that the weather applies to takeoff, in route, and landing. Um, and really start to build that picture of the end-to-end -end process. So kind of goes to address those things that they we saw in, in the research from Riddle that pilots were not, you know, building that weather picture for all aspects of the flight. Another area we cover, you know, we we'll certainly cover adverse weather, synopsis, current weather. We cover those aspects, uh, but we spent a couple slides on NEXRAT so that we, you know, start to let them realize that there are challenges with NEXRAT. It can be delayed. It is delayed. Um, the, how you have it depicted on your screen, depending on the, the color, uh, you know, um, resolutions may be different um, from one view. And we actually even give them a little test here. It's like which, you know, which which screen weather screen looks nice to you if you're trying to land at Elkins. One is has a bunch of red moving toward the airport, the others, you know, greens and yellows. But when they click on the answer, they're told that it was actually the same weather picture from the same device at the same time. So they, it's important that they understand when they're doing their pre-flight planning and even using this in, in, in flight that you understand how your your um, your tools work. Uh, we talk, reiterate, you know, really try to cover that again with understanding how your display is set, which color is going to be used in to, to depict the weather that's out there for you. 
Um, we get into you know forecast, uh, wind direction, speed, NOTAMs, and TFRs cover that. Uh, we have then we have just slides that are not specific maybe to um, the flow, but just how you would interpret the data and use it. So uh, cloud awareness very important for the students to understand. You know, give them a picture of what it looks like to get stuck on top. Um, give them, you know, an, an example here of what it might look like at night if you're coming into, you know, a, a cloud base and you know, can't see it, so they, they get a feel for what that's going to look like. Don't get stuck in a cloud. Um, visibility awareness. We talk about how to, you know, understand how visibility can go down, how difficult it can be to recognize. Uh, we give examples and tools, a, a technique that they can use to actually estimate um, video, uh, visibility um, in flight. Um, high temperatures and density altitude, some recent problems with this for pilots, uh, and even give them an example um, where they can, you know, get a video on what it's like to have density altitude make it difficult for you to take off. So, you know, don't roll the dice, but if you do, you might get lucky and they can see a pilot in this video almost clear the trees. And unfortunately, they can see in this video a pilot that does not clear the trees and actually um, crashes into the trees. No one was killed, so the, the video is, is um, it's a pretty good video to reinforce that it's it's pretty dangerous. The next thing we get into is the go no go decision, bringing it all together. We enforce what you know uh, different no go uh, reasons would be, and then we try to put them into the pilots you know you know pre flight planning seat by giving them a practice scenarios. And in each scenario, there's different different techniques that are um, going to be drilled in. But like the first one, and, and really all the scenarios, we we give them a scenario. Uh, we give them uh, a weather log, which is something they can download at the end of the course along with a checklist, so they can start to build their own profile view of the course. And a lot of the online tools are starting to provide this as well. Joe showed an example of Lightos's version of this, and it's very helpful um, to, to make them start realizing the value in this, where they can start to see along the route the different elements that come in. That we reinforce how these elements are applied on the right hand side to different risk elements reinforce that personal minimums should kind of be documented so they can compare you know the scenario again you know against their own personal minimums and that after they kind of read the scenario and think through they can ask the cfi and then see what the cfi thinks about what the risks were for this flight so we give them um four different scenarios to, to reinforce some of the different things that are in the class um Next section is PyRepps. So we give them, you know, some information on PyRepps, give them some examples here on, you know, why PyRepps, uh, you know, are important. Even give them a demo so they can actually see, watch a video of a pilot providing uh, a PyRep, so that reinforces how how PyRepps work. Um, we conclude uh, in frequent re frequently asked questions and resources sections with giving them a list of all the different resources that the government has out there. Uh, all of these have links that go right to that site. And this is the kind of course where you can come back as many times as you want. You can go to these, these links you know, as you're taking the course. And then we kind of conclude with uh, frequently asked questions to really reinforce the, the things, the misconceptions, like does a self-briefing need to be recorded or documented by the automation sites I use? They can click on this, get the answer. The answer is no, it does not have to be, but it's not a bad idea because it does you know, kind of give you everything in one place, um, you know, and, and you can use that as a, as a, as a, as a good, you know, double check you haven't missed anything. We reinforce that if it's GFA tools that you like interactive maps and they maybe aren't recording what you're doing, they don't know who you are per se, is that okay? Answer is yes, you know, you can use those as long as you kind of cover all the bases. If I conduct a self-brief and still decide to call flight service, will they know what I've done online? And the answer is if you're using a tool that, you know, kind of works with uh, lightest flight service, then they will know. So the answers are provided there. And then lastly, the course concludes with, you know, kind of um, suggesting that they download this, this checklist. So that takes us back to the and let's see. Pick up where we left off there. Uh, this is the student worksheet. Oops. This is a student worksheet here. Um, this is something the students would download. Uh, it tells them right off the bat, call this, you know, give this to your CFI. It uh, tells them what they um, learned. So it's a review as well as a practice sample, uh, practice exercises, list of practice exercises for them to uh, to practice on their own. The CFI document 
is uh, one like two pages like this for every every module. So every section in the in the in the course itself, um, but it's a summary. So the CFI can see get a summary of what the student learned. CFI can also um, see what points should be reinforced. And then there's a whole list of different potential exercises. And this is really ex these are exercises that CFI can give the, the student to um, practice self briefing. So things like, you know, practice the self briefing on a day you're, where the weather's challenging, even if you're not going to fly. Um, you know, watch watch weather outside your window on next on next rad and, and you can compare the results so if you know if you if you're seeing that the storm is coming towards your home uh and now it's it's thundering and lightning outside but you know the next rad images haven't caught up yet just to reinforce delay aspects so so that's what we have um the three components in the education um as far as stakeholder engagement um progress to date uh we've got the message out there um we the advisory circulars out there courses in production um We've got the stakeholders engaged, 30, 31 DCPs have already been, which are document change proposals, 31 different FA documents are already updated. 50% uh, of them are already in the end state. Um, we've, the FISDOs have actually taken the top out there and, and, and we ran this by the NTSB. They validated that it was you know, good content appropriate to address some of the things that they're seeing. Um, kind of next steps is we'll evaluate the WINGS course feedback. So we wanna you know, see what the students are saying. Um, we uh, are actually interested in exploring some research activities with it, and Gary can talk more about that. Is actually getting the course out there in, in places like Amory Riddle, where you know um, you know professors can actually measure its effectiveness, see if anything was left out, see how quickly it takes a student to become kind of competent in doing this, and that's information we can share with other flight schools, uh, letting them know that listen, you know, here's the challenges areas, or you know, on general X number of flights or X number of you know self briefings before they start to really develop um, the skill sets. Uh, we'll continue to mine flight service call. Data to understand what what you know what the pilots need, and we'll continue to promote and engage. So, with that, um, does anyone have any questions? Um, yes, there is one question, Jim. Um, there was a question in, in reference to: um, Is there any data on how many pilots have gone through the course? Yes, there is data on that. Um, it has just gone live, so I don't have any numbers yet uh, on, on how many are out there uh, have taken it. Um, but we've fielded some questions already, you know. So it's I think it's the words getting out. Um, one one of the things that's been very helpful is that the our stakeholders have actually been. Um, you know, promoting the course. They've, uh, you know, we've had articles in AOPA and Flying Magazine, um, Aviation International. So, um, we, you know, we're, we're going to continue to ask the stakeholders get the word out that the AC is out there and the course is out there. And then we will definitely be, you know, working on, um, you know, uh, understanding what, what, what feedback we're getting, as well as, uh, you know, we'll be working kind of uh, our next step is to, to develop an IFR, IFR version of this course as well. Okay. All right. Well, um, and, and uh, uh, Jim and, and Janet, one more question just came in from uh, Jonathan Leffler um, out at the National Weather Service Aviation Weather Center, who, who comments first that it's an excellent course and then asks, are there any efforts in place to change the standard on knowing weather in order to pass a flight <laughs> test or certification. So back to Marilyn for that one, I think. <laughs> no, I have to say that that is a good question. It's something that uh, has been contemplated. I don't think there's any activity in that area, but wouldn't it be nice if each subject area had to be successfully passed and not just the overall test whatever test you're taking at whatever level, because 70 is passing. Uh, it would be nice if every subject area needed to have at least uh, an adequate passing grade and not just the overall. Um, I'm not sure how to make that happen. Yeah, and, and actually, Marilyn, um, since you have had left, we've actually, you know, we're starting to poke at that a little bit and, and um, you know, see if we can make some traction with the, the group that runs the test, the, you know, the test bank. Um, so even if, um, you know, the questions that are out there, if we could add more questions around self briefing, um, you know, pilots study the whole all the questions. So so we're, we're going to try to see if we can do more around the uh, the questions and the test as well, or at least engaging with that group. Yes, we've already had some preliminary dialogue, and so um, we'll see what happens. 
All right. Well, thank you, everyone. And and, and Jim, uh, I, I know you'll take a look at the chat. Uh, there there's some really wonderful comments there for for you and Janet and and your group. Don Ike asked about uh, where he can get uh, he, he how he can get to the course, which I think you said you were going to leave in the, a link in the chat. Is that correct? Yes, I'm going to I'm going to put a link in the chat um, right now that uh, you can go and get access to the you know kind of like the offline version of the class. So it won't give you you won't have the option to take the test, um, but uh, you, know, you can certainly go to the wings the wings site as well. But I'll, I'll put the link out there and you can uh, you can poke around at it. Yeah, and and do leave the wing site uh, information too in case people want to want to do the full Monty, please. And by the way, I got to tell you that you know you you guys briefed this at least in in kind of in passing one or two FPAs ago that you know that that you had this course and you know you you were briefing people. I, at least I recall that kind of a a comment. And you know it's just one of many comments that goes by, and we're all busy and we file it away in the back of the head, but. I, I got to tell you that 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 if I, if I have to take an online course for my own good, which I have to take a lot of online security courses for my own good and stuff like that, I'd, I'd be all over that one. I'd want to take that several times just to go back over that. That is a great looking package that you guys put together. Kudos to you. Oh, thank you very much. And then that was within partnership collaboration with the FAST team. Um, we, you know, we we kind of developed the storyboards that, that we had a PowerPoint version of it, and then they took it and turned it into the the online interactive version. So um, it was really, really um, a nice team effort to get get it out there. Very good. OK, thanks, Jim. Um, next, we are going to hear from um, Gary Picardner, and he will be presenting on the research for enhancing weather in the cockpit. So Gary, you um, go ahead with your uh, presentation and um, don't worry about going over. We will take um, a few minutes from our break time, okay? Okay, and I don't think I'll go over. Um, can Sorry. you hear me, Janet, and see this yes, briefing? We yes, okay. we can. So I'm going to cover some um, research efforts related. Uh, Jim covered some of our older briefings that we've given at FPAW and other places that were done by Emory Riddle and uh, Pegasus. But I want to start out before I go into this um, presentation. I'm going to seemingly go off on a tangent just to kind of, after Jim's really excellent briefing, sort of give another perspective to maybe generate some conversation later after this. And hey, people, Gary, yeah, Gary, I'm sorry. Uh, um, uh, I don't think you're sharing yet. Oh, you're not saying it. We, we see you. You're looking good, but I don't see your brief. Uh, let's see. Uh, let me try again. OK, uh, that's the one thing. Let's see. Oh, I see. Wait, that's, let me find it. I see. Uh, hmm. F plus now. Is that doing it? Yes. Yes, sir. You got it. OK, but I hadn't started the charts. So yeah. my tangent's going to be for people who are under 55 or 60 or have never lived in New Jersey. There was actually a time when you pulled into a gas station that for 25 to 30 cents per gallon, a gas station attendant would come out, they'd pump their gas, They'd check your oil, they'd wash your windows, they'd check other fluids. If your tires were low, they would pump tires and do all that. And it was included with your gas station. Every time you went to the gas station, your car not only got gas, but a person actually helped you maintain it. Then we had the what was the first gas shortage and gas shot up from about 30 cents a gallon to a dollar or more. And some of you may remember this a lot, probably down in the younger crowd. And obviously getting that big of increase in gas prices was a sticker shock. So the gas stations got this bright idea. Hey, if you self-serve, we can charge a little less. It'll be cheaper and it'll save us hiring as much staff. And lo and behold, people started pumping their own gas. And then they also had full service. If you wanted to get your car maintained, you'd pay a little more and you'd get a gas station attendant. He'd come out and do services that in the prior years had all been included. Then over time, their serve, the full service sort of became we pump the gas and don't do anything else. And the self-service line started getting things like paper towels so you could check your own oil, squeegees you could clean your own windows. 
And then it evolved into having stores where you could go in and actually buy oil, things to maintain your car. And then it even added sandwiches and food, none of which actually taught people how to maintain their cars. Some people who were car guys were really motivated and probably every time we get to a gas station, do those services to keep their cars running. While I'm sure a lot of people don't even know how to open their hood and have never checked their oil once when they get gas or anything else. And I think you can kind of see where some of the similarities to things you just heard and see. It's great to have super training, which that course I think everybody agrees is excellent, but doesn't mean everybody's going to take it. People don't always read their car manuals. People don't always take maintenance courses on what they should do for their cars. If you imply to get your driver's license, you got to go out and take a couple courses on how to change flat tires, fill oil, et cetera. A lot of people would probably grumble. So, you know, there's a belief, I think, on a lot of people that general aviation pilots are like 121. You know, 121 is very rigid and they've got to take all this training. GA, a lot of them tend to view it sort of like a car. Hey, I learned to fly. I go out. I'll do what I think is safe. And if you start monkeying too much around there, some people are really want to be safe and they'll be very receptive to training and do this and motivated. Others believe they know it and don't. And then others just are outright lazy and maybe go, oh, I should, I'll get to it sometime, just like checking your oil. And before you know it, you've broken down on the road because you ran out of oil or you get a flat tire because you haven't been pumping it up. Hey, Gary, so, can, we, can you go into slideshow mode for us, please? Oh, yeah, good idea. I'm glad I didn't start showing the slides. They, <laughs> Well, I was trying to I was trying to get a word in, but he hadn't breathed yet. So, uh, <laughs> OK, yeah. OK, so based on this kind of simile and places where you see similarities, one of the first things we started doing as we looked at this, whereas we can see why the evolution to self briefings has been occurring. There's obviously a cost benefit. There's obviously efficiency ex, uh, benefits. Um, it's sort of consistent with where technology is going. Certainly younger pilots have not, probably haven't had the same sort of training with flight service where they were absolutely told you must call. So it's sort of a natural evolution to move to these self-service briefings. So our question was, and kind of using that simile I was giving you at the gas station is, are they really as effective? Um, and to answer Amber's question, a study we did about nine years ago, we when self briefings were really starting to gain in popularity. We actually compared a bunch of them. And what you found is kind of what you'd expect is, is she was asking, the human factors was pretty different. A lot of times products would cater to certain types of people who had preferences on their weather products and things they were comfortable with. And then other things that might be every bit as important or just as important as what they were comfortable with but it wasn't really what they either were trained in or didn't know quite how to use it, would get pushed down where you'd have to do a lot of button clicks. And in some cases, relevant information or information that should be used in a flight brief was found not even to be available on the platform. So that study was done about nine years ago, and I'm sure it's pretty much out of date that there's been a lot of evolution. And hearing Amber's question, and as I talk about this study, it may be something that we need to um, kind of bring up to current states and see if platforms have improved. And it actually is going to be one of the results of this study that um, is going to be is in the midst of being conducted by Emory Riddle. And what it is, is we want to look at the effectiveness of self briefings versus a specialist provided briefing. And the research drivers here are really understanding the implications of the shift. Is it really a benefit or is it more a convenience? Are people coming away when they do a self-serve briefing? Are they really coming away with that full flight picture of what they're going to encounter with weather? Do they have enough knowledge and understanding on how to use the information that's being presented? Are they taking the time to take training courses and actually go out there so these briefings are comprehensive, complete, and giving them a full picture? And as you saw from Jim, some of the earlier studies that we did um, that were done by Embry Riddle and Pegasus showed that there were a lot of knowledge gaps in pilots' knowledge and that pilots also had um, a tendency not to have a really good picture of what they were going to encounter after doing a self-briefing. So that's where this came along. The other thing we wanted to do in this study is ident identification of possible performance gaps in GA pilot weather self-briefings. 
including the use of aviation apps, as well as we also hope to um, identify maybe some minimum requirements for self-briefing platforms. So that's our key outputs here. We want to get this comparison done. We want to get weather scenarios that we can use for future studies, and we'd like to develop recommendations for self-briefing systems to make sure that each one may be a little unique and there's always going to be personal preferences, but we do want them to provide a minimum performance level such that if you use them and you use them properly, you're going to come away with the necessary knowledge. Right now, where we are on this, the status for this study, there have been five scenarios selected, mostly focusing with fog and icing. They've identified 300 images per scenario, and we're using four flight as a example. We're not actually using the four flight, but they're replicating it as one of the more, since it's one of the more popular platforms that's going to be used as the self as a model for our self serve briefing. Uh, an example of what we've got is uh, weather's VFR at briefing 30 to 45 minutes prior to departure, and it's projected to be IFR upon arrival. An example of the icing scenario is clouds are projected to build or move into the route and temperatures are conducive for icing, weather clear at the time of briefing. They've already conducted some focus groups uh, with GA pilots to identify some issues and information on how they view self briefings, places where there may be some difficulties. And they're also have begun developing a mock or simulated for flight tool for use when we do the studies in the lab. As part of these initial focus groups, and you've heard a couple of people mention this, but some of the reasons that we've already identified why flight services are called that'll be focused in on the study is if they're doing a cross-country flight, if there's a possibility of severe weather, an instructor forced them to do it, or if they're confused after they do a self-briefing and they recognize that confusion. Some of the challenges listed for self-briefings are some of the graphs they find confusing, sometimes the legends are confusing, uh, coded weather information, and the big one really is a lack of a method to ask questions on a particular weather product. Um, and they've completed work domain analysis for flight service specialists. And this is to enable uh, one of their people to do a role play of being an actual flight service specialist in the study to compare. So that's one of the studies, and we are now in the second year of that, and that'll hopefully be completed um, early in 22, I believe is what the current schedule is showing. So there's still a bit of work to be done on that study. I'm going to talk about a couple of weeks. So the other issue, as I noted, is how anxious people are to do training. So what we've been trying to do are develop a variety of training tools of different things, which you saw with gyms is a very comprehensive tool and somebody has got to be motivated. Uh, we've tried to also develop some mini courses. I think um, one of the things he showed on density altitude is one of the 10 mini courses that we developed. Um, they're available here if people want to check them out. I'm not going to show them, but we have 10 specific topics. They're very short with quizzes. So if somebody gets into trouble or they want to just brush up on a specific topic, it's about five minutes of their time. We also are starting to look at using virtual reality, and I'm going to talk about this a little more on the next slide. Um, it's now available. We have a virtual reality model in our augmented reality application, which is called Weather Explorer, and we're starting to evaluate the benefits of whether virtual reality and the cost involved is actually a benefit. Um, if you go to this YouTube site, you can kind of get a look at what this virtual reality tool is. If you have the Weather Explorer app and you download the current version, you can see we have a thunderstorm on there and you can actually see it on your two dimensional display, but it'll come across as a 3D moving model and you can walk around the storm and get a feel that you can have the arrow, see where the updrafts are, et cetera. And it's actually kind of neat what you can do with it. Um, I did this little course on it and I actually found it, it does help with retention because you really are experiencing it more than just a textbook. So an experiment that we're considering, this is not um, on contract yet, but it's one I think we're, we're looking at really seriously. And the idea of this project is to really hope uh, potential to decrease potential aircraft loss of control uh, in flight. And the basis of this is using virtual reality and what's called a recognition prime decision model. And the idea of this is that a lot of reaction or 
decision making when you're in a high pressure situation is more done out of a reflex. You're not usually sitting there doing a lot of cognitive thought. And the, this model, I guess, came about watching fire chiefs when they were fighting big fires. They weren't sitting there pulling out algorithms and remembering what was in the class, but they really relied on their experience throughout their careers on how fires were, thought, were fought and were making rapid decisions. And what we're trying to do is put more of the training into the ability to get experience, because one of the hard parts with weather, it's great to sit here and take a course and have somebody talk and look at PowerPoint, but that doesn't necessarily get you trained and have the experience of encountering bad weather. And unfortunately, or fortunately, I guess, depending how you look at it, there aren't a lot of flight instructors that want to take their students right into a storm or into icing and say, OK, get us out for obvious reasons. But if you can do it in simulators, which, again, a lot of student pilots in GA don't have access to really high fidelity trainers, that gets expensive. So we're trying to bring some of these tools through virtual reality onto products you can use on your own laptops, on your cell phones, and actually develop experience where you encounter some of these difficult situations and can practice getting out of them. So that's the idea, and we're looking at doing this with these virtual reality models. And this may be a project coming up in FY22 if we can get approval to use the funding. Unfortunately, virtual reality models are still kind of expensive to develop. So we've got to see whether or not we'll have sufficient funding to conduct this. Another effort we're doing, and this has to do with the need for PIREPs. Um, this is being done by the Pegasus Group, and they're calling it a SkyRep. And the idea what they're trying is they're using imagery from the Alert Wildfire Camera Network out in California, and they're kind of focusing a lot on stratus and fog events, which can be difficult to forecast. And I'm going to skip, I have a couple other bullets, but I actually can show you on the next slide, I think it's easier to show how this works. Out there, they've got tons of cameras at different altitudes, and what they've been doing is, as you can see from these images, if you look at a camera and you start at the one on the left, you can tell it's in the clouds, and you know the altitude of the camera, so you basically can color the square. Then you look at the one that's drawn around 13, 14, that's above it, and you can tell you're above the clouds, and you know the altitude of the camera. Go to the next one, you can see it's in the clouds, and so on. And the idea is by doing this and using these things, you may not get an exact cloud base and cloud top number that's completely accurate, but it does give the pilots kind of like a PIREP, very accurate numbers on what's clear, what's definitely in the cloud. So hopefully it works kind of like a PIREP. And in the studies so far with using this, it's good for day and night conditions. Uh, it's been shown to be pretty accurate when compared with some of the PIREP reports. And the migration to operations, we may have um, an ability to automate. Right now, they're using people to look at the cameras in sort of a crowdsourcing manner. But some of the um, algorithms that are out there already for um, edge detection and other things may be able to be used for this, that we could automate this system. And at least in selected areas like these places in California where fog events tend to be a problem, could use something like this to enhance PIREP information coming into the system. Another study we've been doing that you heard Jim touch on, and this I've briefed in the past, is trying to come up with ways to automate, automate v, VNR. And one of the reasons that we're interested in doing this is AOPA has done some studies in the past and found that pilots who use this do put a lot of value on getting a VNR recommendation. And they also feel, as we move to automation, that considering inadvertent flight into IMC continues to be a significant issue that losing a tool that does help pilots with making these sorts of decisions is probably not the right direction. So right now what we're trying to do is come up with the thresholds that are, I will call nominally conservative. We did some earlier studies, which I'd briefed in the past, where we found that um, flight service specialists in giving VNR on a lot of the scenarios, especially when they were more or less marginal, um, would be about 50-50. So depending who you called, you might get a VFR and told go ahead, or you might get a VNR decision. So we're trying to make the selection of whether it's VNR or VFR much more objective. So we've gotten the scenarios complete. And what we're working on now is when we did our first study, we found that everyone, pilots and flight service specialists, did not really have a 
true standard process that was being followed. People would do different things. So what we're trying to do is also document for the automation and to help if a pilot calls a flight service specialist, the people are following a more standard approach, looking at tools in an organized manner. And that's what you're seeing here for the automation is to kind of, and this is a slide that sort of says, when you start out first at the synopsis level, we found that a lot of the flight service specialists, the first thing they do is take a more generic look and then start narrowing down. It's like, where are the major areas on my route? Are there areas that are red that look like they're gonna be an issue? And then they start using other products in those areas. And this is kind of trying to document a logical flow for automation to send over to have an automation system developed, as well as to be used both by pilots and the flight specialists to try to get people on the same page as they come to these decisions. Because in our initial study with VNR, we just found people were looking at all different products. Some people were focusing on takeoff and didn't care about landings. In route was always kind of weak where people weren't using a lot of tools in route. Some guys had the feeling, well, I'm there, I'm more worried about landing I don't, and didn't spend much time using tools that were telling them about their takeoff area. There were issues that were found in studies that said they weren't using forecast products that people tended to use now cast and didn't have a real good handle on forecast. So we're trying to pick some of these up for the automation to get an objective method in determining VNR and to make that method known. So if you have a higher risk tolerance, you at least know the thresholds that are being used when you're told to VNR a flight. And this is kind of giving you an example of some of the decisions that go into this thresholding. You know, how far out, when we ask the pilots, how far out do you want trending information? Is it plus one, plus two? How far from center line of your path would you consider a METAR or a CWA information relevant? And there's a wide range there, and we're going to try to come up with something that's sort of a nominal, that's not overly conservative. But again, you don't want to also VNR every flight. That doesn't work either. So it's trying to figure out what that sweet spot is that people will look at as being reasonable for saying, yeah, that's a good distance if it's there. I get why you're, you might VNR a flight. And then another example of the types of question is, would you prefer a compilation, sort of an overall summary of the weather products? or more of an extrapolation. So those are the kind of questions we're trying to work out. Most of the study is complete now as far as being ready to bring in the pilots and we're hoping to run both what we're calling VNR two and three, which should be a full set of threshold recommendations um, sometime this spring and hopefully we'll have the results by the summer and can then pass that along to flight services and to LIDOS for to hopefully have um, implementation developed. So our goal is really to just identify the thresholds and provide recommendations on values and a, a structure for it, but not to actually build the automation. And that's pretty much it. That's a, a quick summary of some of the projects related to the topics you've heard. Um, I think after our break, we have time for questions, but if anybody had any questions here, um, I can probably, if it's one or two, I can take them. Otherwise, I think we're going to have a small panel discussion after our next break. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you Gary. Um, at this time, we will, it's 2.02. So um, we are scheduled to take a break um, from now until 2.15. Um, we have had a very long session and so um, we will break now until 2 15 and then after the break we will have a discussion panel um, with all of our panelists and we'll just um, either if we don't have any discuss any questions from um, the group then we will actually have um, questions um, for the panel and then we will just um, have some dialogue from the panel itself. And, so. and Janice, have you have you budgeted uh, three to five minutes to look at the at the post session survey results in your? Um, yes, we can do that if we have um, if we have those results um, prior to our time ending. I th I think we can do that. Um, okay. Uh, but but let me let me just say verbally to the group, please, please, please 
click on that link that's in the chat. It's the last item in chat, I think, uh, that was posted. And uh, and go to Meeting Pulse and take the survey and and show Janet and Jim and Marilyn and Frankie and and uh, and Joe and Gary uh, how well you've been listening and how much you learned over the last couple of hours. Okay, thank you. And so we'll see everyone back at two fifteen. Thank you, Janet. Thank you. Hey, this is uh, Jordan Girth. I just wanted to do an audio check. Hey, you're uh, Jordan, there. Five by five. Thank you so much.
All righty, Janet, I've got uh, 2.15 and 15 seconds. So um, if you want to uh, get the Spanish Inquisition set up and let's start asking questions. Okay. All right, so we have um, our panelists, which are um, Frankie Pratt and um, Joe Donnelly and Jim Hayesman and Gary Picodner um, on. And I first want to thank each one of them for taking the time to be um, to present um, today. Um, it was a lot of work and preparation, and I just want to publicly thank each one of them for the time um, that they took over the several months to prepare um, for their presentations. So I want to just open up. I don't I didn't see any questions in the chat um, so far, but I wanted to just open up this um, discussion with a question and any one of you can answer the question any way you like. Um, what are some of the advances in technology um, within your Pacific area um, for flight service? Do you actually see coming in the near future? Like I can take a cut at that one, Janet. Um, okay. Now I, I think uh, you know if we kind of go back to um, the, the initial, you know, graph that I had had there, where I said you know look at kind of supply and demand, and when you you know look at uh, advances like with weather cameras, for instance, um, great advance, and and that was covered in the uh, in the video um, that uh, that you you showed earlier, Janet. Um, so it, I, mean, I think everyone's probably familiar with it, but you know if not, I mean you know you can go out, you can go to a website, you can actually look at a camera that's in a mountain that you might be trying to fly through or planning to fly through. So. Um, that's that's becoming very helpful in in, in mountainous areas um, but really it could be used any, anywhere where the weather could be unpredictable but what that potentially could drive then is uh, and actually i think it is actually where pilots then can call flight service which is still part of you know, like like you know flight service in the air so in in-air contact um you're still you know taking you're still using a resource that that would be you know kind of um, allocated and you know you could see things like that where like okay um you know more and more pilots will actually making be making in-flight calls but at the same time then you have advances where internet would be potentially very you know cheap and affordable to bring right into the cockpit so pilots can go directly you know right to their own internet you know website in air so i i think you'll see a lot of advances in areas like that where you know more content and, and larger bandwidth content can be brought to the the uh the cockpit and that could be you know certainly through adsb but it could also just be through like starlink and other other uh, internet um, that might be available right okay all right thanks so another question um that i have is um what um how do we get the stakeholders um, more involved in promoting the new message about flight service. How can we how can we do that? Anyone? Is there a way for us to get the stakeholders involved? And the reason I, I asked the question is that because there is a paradigm shift and I think Marilyn um, um, talked about that as far as um, and then I think someone else talked about it, and I think Joe, you may you may have mentioned in the fact that the pilots have been thinking the same way for such a long time. Call flight service, call flight service, and now we are we we've moved into a, a different direction. Is that we want them to um, self brief prior to calling flight service? How do you change the paradigm? What else could we do? to help um, move that along. So, so it's like Janet. a $64,000 question. <laughs> 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 and, and I'll take two seconds, uh, okay. Frankie, and then I'll pass it off. Um, we've been ingrained for so long to do this a certain way, right? Um, we work with flight schools, and inevitably what they tell their students to do is call flight service. So I, I think I think our stakeholders are engaged and I think they want to do everything they can to make this paradigm shift. But we have to, I think it comes down to outreach almost. And you know, how do we get to these flight schools? 
how do we get to instructors to say, okay, it's not a bad thing to use automation. And, and in the end, at the end of the day, if they really have to call flight service or they call them, I mean, we're not promoting, okay, we're unplugging the phones at, at 12 o'clock on, on June 30th. The, the point is, I, I think we need to get people to understand the teachers of flying it's okay to use the automation and then it's an, an acceptable method to do so. Over. Okay. Frankie. All right. Frankie. I think that we're already we're already doing it. This is the first we have taken the first few steps, which are identify what the challenges are and engage with some of the stakeholders, develop some of the tools such as the courses and and start getting the message out there in in meetings like today, like the conference today. And from there, we're also communicating through different lines of business, Gary on his work or with flight service directly in some of the research that we're doing with the flight schools, with the universities that are the ones that put out the big message. Hey, this is how we're doing it and start having them understand that this is what we what you need to start teaching. You need to start moving from this is the only way to these are the ways you can do it because we also have to remember not everybody learns the same way and not everybody understands the same way. So like Joe said, we're not unplugging the phones on X date. We're still going to be here and flight service specialists are still going to be there to provide the help and we have to understand that not all students will understand in the same way. They're not they're not all 16, 25 year olds starting to learn how to fly. We still have some older folks that are beginning to learn that this is what they want to do, and they don't necessarily understand how to use the online platform. So we still provide the opportunity of calling someone and getting the information in that sense. But for the time being, what we're doing is, hey, getting the message out there. We're updating the publications, which is a huge step once the AIM gets updated and the aviation weather handbook comes out and people have a better tool to actually understand how all this stuff works, mm -hmm. then, then we can start expecting the message to really get out there. It's not going to happen overnight. It's probably not going to happen in the next year, but then more right. people start to see, hey, hey, this is this is OK for me to use and I understand how to use it because now this awesome aviation weather handbook is out there and it tells me exactly what this product or what this set of information means. Then we can start getting the message uh, out there better and actually having people shift to better self serve themselves. I also I want to comment on this. I also think you don't want it to go too fast as Jim showed and a lot of the Wittick studies on knowledge have shown. There's a lot of gaps in aviation relevant meteorological knowledge right now. These aren't, I saw somebody ask, we're not trying, the, we, the tests we gave were not for meteorologists. They were aviation relevant meteorological questions. And in a lot of sections, the scores were failing. They were 50% or below. So when you push people to self brief, you're assuming they know how to use the products and they know what they're doing. So I think the idea of pushing and trying to make that go faster uh, could lead to issues. I think you really have to make sure that your population that's moving over really understands the products, that you've addressed these knowledge gaps in some manner, whether it's a course like Jim has, to, uh, training materials Wittix come out with, whether CFIs focus more. You know, a lot of CFIs, when we work with NAFI a lot, don't like teaching weather. Not only don't they know it that well, they'll readily admit they don't want to teach weather. It's not something they enjoy. They know they have to do it. And they say a lot of students don't want to learn it. You know, they're paying a lot of money to learn to fly. They worry mm -hmm. about weather after they get their license. So mm -hmm. people will a lot of times get a pilot license and really haven't focused a lot on weather. So I think you have a lot of other obstacles before you push, I think the self briefings are very effective for people who are self motivated, take training and stay current. But if you're not doing recurrent weather training and didn't learn at the beginning, I think if the FAA pushes too much, they may find that opens some additional risks that we haven't had. And again, the other thing I think you'll see in stats with 121 and even 135, you get guys on the ground who are helping, you know, that gives you a level of independence 
when you start being the guy who's briefing and making the decisions, you start getting the get home other pressures coming in because you're the guy who feels the need. You're the one who has the family screaming, we want to get to the beach. If you're the guy on the ground, you can be a little more objective when you look at the weather and go, it's not my kid screaming, I wouldn't go, it's not a good time to fly. If you're the guy flying, making these decisions, so sometimes having, well, even if it's a digital co-pilot, which I know is out there as a product, having something to give you feedback, and I think that's one of the reasons we really like the VNR automation, is hopefully if that comes up and says, don't go, and you decide to go, you'll at least take the time to see what it is the hazards are that's telling you not to go, and whether you really believe you can manage that risk. Wow, you, you know, <laughs> you know, I, you, you know, as you were talking, Gary, you know, the the one thing that just kept flashing in, in my mind was safety. I, I mean, you, you know, because uh, you, you know, as a as a former briefer, to me, that was paramount. That was paramount over having to get there um, because I needed to get there. It was paramount over the fact that you, you know, either um, regardless of what it was, you you, you see, and so it, it seems to me that the rush, rush, rush is at some point um, actually overrides that fact and that irregardless of whether weather is good, irregardless of whether or not someone did, someone said not go, um, it, it's like, well, where's the safety factor? And understanding and being able to effectively interpolate the weather is really because I want to be safe. I want to make sure that not only am I safe, but my family is safe, or whoever I'm, I'm flying with is safe. And that is really, when you think about it, that's why um, when you think about the NTSB and they have accident after accident, and it's all, most of them are weather related, that's what it's all about. So where, where do you draw the line? Um, and that's, I think that's the big thing. It, you know, really it comes down to the individual pilot. How safe do you want to be? How much information do you want to have? How knowledgeable do you want to be so that when I get in my airplane, I want to be safe? I want to be able to make a knowledgeable decision about whether or not to fly or whether or not uh, I'm going to stay home and I'm going to fly another day. Really, hey, when you think about it, it's a personal decision. Would you not Janet, say so? it's Marilyn. Could I address what you yes, just said? Yes, go ahead, Marilyn. We have... We have three, two minutes now, so I will give okay. you the floor. So <laughs> I think one of the things that we, we really haven't touched on is that with so much automation in the cockpit, I see from a CFI perspective, pilots relying on the technology to uh -huh. do the for them. Unfortunately, they don't all understand what that technology can do for them or how to how to utilize it properly. And in the case of, of the go, no go or the get homeitis, you know, well, I'll just use my radar to get around a thunderstorm or I'll find a way through the weather by using, you know, technology in the cockpit. And mm -hmm. I think that's one of the problems. I think I see that we could do a better job training our CFIs to train pilots as well. Mm. Okay. And one other point, Marilyn, is the limitations of it. It's not only not how do you use it, but a lot of people don't understand the limitations. Of, of the information, you know, and one of the ones we're looking at a study is how, how much decorrelation occurs as you move away. If you have a METAR and you're 60 miles away, is that representative of your area of flight? Can you use it if it's only rated for 30 miles? Do you understand that? Do you, how, much, how much probability do you put in there or probabilistic information as you move away? Or if you're over rugged terrain and the nearest thing is 10 miles away, do you still trust it? If you're in a mountainous region or you're in the Grand Canyon, how much can you trust those numbers? Right, right. Okay. Um, well, I hate for us to, this is, so you guys are really getting on a roll and I know, but I have to cut you off. So, uh, <laughs> so at this point, um, Matt, Matt has put up our um, before, pre and post um, survey results. And wow, look at number one comparison and number two, Wow. Okay. Looks like um, you guys did your job. Well, yeah, but but they got tired as the day went on, um, you think? Uh, Janet, because um, be, because numbers numbers uh, questions number six and seven have almost identical uh, oh, replies. Oh yes, I see that. Yes, I see. 
Okay. Uh, anyhow, Jan, I'll have this for you guys uh, after we're done in in a more tangible form. But I just wanted to throw this up there to uh, to, to show folks that uh, at, at least as far as the question of um, legal briefing, certified briefing, I think they heard that loud and clear. Yes, they um, did. And as as far as the question of uh, recording or digitally logged, I think they heard that loud and everybody heard that loud and clear. Um, uh, but there are some others where where somehow the message got muddied up a little bit, so uh, it wasn't quite as loud and clear. Or oh, I can spin this a different way. Previously, most everybody had the right answer here anyhow, so we still have the same amount of people with the right answer. <laughs> well, I want to take this opportunity again to thank the panelists for um, their participation. I want to thank you, Matt and Matthias, for allowing us the opportunity to present today. And I want to thank the audience for your um, active participation in our poll and for um, allowing us to present to you. Um, thank you so much and um, have a great day. I have one more thing, Janet. Uh, there were some questions that came up on the chat while we were talking. If we could receive those, please, and we'll be more than happy to take a look at them and discuss them and send out some answers because there are some very good points that are being made on the chat. Yeah, and and uh, by the way, if if uh, you know if, if those of you who can answer those questions uh, decide to remain on for the next fascinating session that's going to start in thirty seconds, uh, and you want to take a run at them, please feel free. Okay, we will do that. Thank you. All Matt. right. So, um, uh, thank you, Janet. Thank you, Jim. Thank you, team. You guys did a great job, and as as we told you all along. Y'all set the bar so high for getting ready for one of these meetings that I, I'm not sure anybody's going to achieve this. You guys were just top drawer. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, thank you, man.